Hello? Press the button. Sorry, sorry, we're just trying to get the microphone to work. Hello, hello. Yeah. I think we got it to work. Good evening, everyone. Um, so welcome to our PBUSD board meeting. Uh, we do have translation in Spanish. Uh, please, if you need that support, um, please see Orania Lopez. She's in our, the little room over there. Um, so tenemos traducción en español. Si necesita es, uh, de este servicio, por favor, pase con uh, Orania Lopez. If um, someone would like to speak on an item on the agenda, please complete a speaker card and put it in the basket. Or, okay, so it'll be over here near uh, uh, Julian, and then Julian will bring it to Eva. Um, each item will have, but it needs to be completed before the item begins, and each speaker will have two minutes. So we will go on to item 3.2, our uh, Pledge of Allegiance, and I will ask um, Trustee De Serpa, please lead us into the pledge. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We will now move on to our superintendent comments. Yes, thank you very much. So I just want to give a, an update to everyone um, regarding um, Pajaro and just really extend um, some thank yous to our to our staff. So, so everyone knows we serve um, a little over 1,600 students who live in Mo the Monterey area and a few that also go to Watsonville High School. Um, we have really has seen great attendance um, these last couple of days. And so I'm proud to report that PMS is now having an attendance rate of approximately 90%. Um, Ohlone is up to 75%. And Hall has maintained strong um, at about 93%. Um, and all of that is due to the fact that we have staff who have individually called each and every family who did not show up. 
So we have Healthy Start staff, our um, parent engagement staff, special education, special services staff, um, and student services that have all come together um, to really support. And so I just want to give you a little glimpse into um, some of the things that our teams have done at the shelters. So we actually have staff that every morning at 6 a.m. go to the shelters to help wake children up and get them on the right bus. Um, so that is uh, mostly our extended learning staff, our parent engagement staff, and our um, staff from student services. Um, we also have, um, we're individually, as I mentioned, uh, connecting with families. If they can't get there, um, we're providing them with um, short-term independent study. We are providing learning options and um, provided um, our technology department went out and gave all of our students that didn't have Chromebooks their Chromebooks um, and hotspots. And the last thing I just want to mention is our MNO staff um, have done some really miraculous work at, at um, Lakeview. I won't go into that because I know that's going to be later. I don't want to burst their bubble. Um, but i um, done some really great stuff. And then now we're trying to help the community get back to Bajro. And one of the things that's getting in the way is that there is not sewer and water there. So we, they started it. Um, so Clint Rucker, our CBO, and um, Sergio and Herlindo um, worked um, and I believe Ruth as well, um, worked with um, the county of Monterey to, within 24 hours, have an agreement. Um, and our parking lot and our basketball courts are going to be used for, um, for they call them comfort stations, but they're basically showers, um, toilets, and hand washing stations so that people can get back to their homes and get back into Pajaro. Um, and so I just want to say a deep appreciation for all the staff that have come together and done that work. This right here, so thank you. Um, these pictures, these pictures that you see are um, the many organizations that are donating. So um, we have we have really happy students. All these students are from Maloney Elementary. Um, they were getting treated by the PVHS drama team. So a picture prior to that, this is the PVHS drama team that came out and really wanted to lift the spirits of all of our students. And then if you click back, these are all Amazon donations. So they had this really wonderful idea of doing Amazon wish list and we have been having both um, name donors and anonymous donors who daily are coming and sending our students, our staff, um, our families things that they had asked for off of the wish list. And so, and then they also developed a room um, where parents can come in and basically we're telling people you don't have shoes, you don't have clothes, you don't have um, diapers, whatever you need come to the school site and we will actually clothe you, feed you, and make sure that you're ready for school. Um, so thank you to everyone. Thank you. All right, we will move on to item 3.4, our governing board comments, uh, reports on standing committee meetings. And this is the opportunity for each board member to make a few comments. Um, and I usually start outside in, but I'll, I'll reverse that since our, our student trustee is not here with us this evening. Um, let, we'll start with Trustee Scow. Uh, good evening, everybody, and to everybody watching on YouTube. We have a lot of people who watch our meetings on YouTube, and so thank you for doing that. Thank you for staying in touch with the district. These are obviously very uh, difficult times for our community. It's been very heartening to see a lot of uh, generosity, people caring, putting in their own time, their own money into helping with the tragedy in Pajaro. Um, and I've been really heartened to see a lot of good connections between leaders, elected leaders from both Santa Cruz County, Monterey County. Those connections have been getting stronger. Thank you to our superintendent for the work you've been doing. I know you've been putting in extra hours and helping out. Um, with with the the difficult transitions that that you just described i want to thank our teachers at at uh lakeview and pajaro middle school who have had to absorb another school and had to adjust on the fly and um it's not going to be a a perfect 
uh, without incident, but it's I g hats off to their work, their effort, uh, and adjusting on the fly. Um, and uh, and uh, your work is appreciated. Um, something that struck me is, and I know there's a lot of uncertainty about uh, the rebuild and how long that's going to take and who's going to pay for it. And I think it's just important to remember this happened uh, amidst an already a, a cost of living crisis in our region. And this is going to hurt some of the most low income folks in our region. But we've already had a cost of living crisis uh, in our region. And as our district uh, grapples with, with salaries and raises and all these things, um, I do feel uh, personally that those of us and those who make less money, frankly, have a harder time. And so um, it's, a, it's a collective responsibility. It's something that, as a board trustee, it's a lens I keep on with respect to inequality within our own district. Um, which has long been the case, and I'm not saying that everybody's going to make the same salary, but we have to find a way so that people can actually survive here and, and stay here and, and want to stay here. And I know that we have an on ongoing staffing challenges with respect to that, uh, w whether that's classified teachers and, and principals as well, to be fair. And so that's a lens I'm looking at, and as we, as we tackle those challenges going forward, and I really want it to be fair and to be and to work for our district. Um, a principal told me uh, the other week, and I'm not going to name the principal, that they were concerned about both principal salaries and teacher salaries. And the principal told me one of his younger teachers, one of the more promising teachers, uh, was concerned about their ability to stay with our district. And to my concern, the principal said, eh, this district doesn't have a history of, of treating our young teachers well. I don't blame you if you leave. It made me very sad and disconcerted. And I just hope that we can turn this around. This Board of Trustees working with this administration can turn this around and figure out a way to, to maximize our budget so that we can deliver the services we must deliver at our school sites. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Vice President Acosta? Um, good evening. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's meeting. Um, I, uh, when was it? Last week, I think it was, um, uh, attended our district safety committee meeting. Uh, safety committee meeting. It was good to hear that the doors um, at the towers have been updated and that employees who work at the district towers have been given their access cards to the building. Um, it would also be great if we can have an update um, to the board at a future board meeting about the continued security efforts of the towers and the public's access into the towers. Um, as I recall from um, when a previous board, a few boards back, we approved the purchase of the towers building. We had discussions about security measures at the towers and it would be good to have an update um, on that brought to this board. Um, I also had the opportunity, I attended our um, intergovernmental committee meeting, which I believe that was also last week. It was also great to see the attendance of myself, my colleague, Trustee um, Flores, as well as other elected officials from the city of Watsonville, Councilwoman Parker and Councilwoman Orozco. Um, in that meeting, we discussed several important matters regarding the district and the city of Watsonville, including the recent flood issues in our community, as well as safe roadways in our community, including city and county roadways that lead into our district schools. Um, we also discussed at that meeting the importance of uh, looking at including elected officials in Monterey County that represent in that area of our district's boundaries, since our district does have boundaries throughout Monterey County, um, especially in light of the recent flood issues that have impacted our families of this community in that area. Um, and then, oh, and I just wanted to make a note um, to my colleagues and as well in public that I was unable to attend our agenda setting committee meetings um, meeting regarding the scheduling of our upcoming special board meetings that are on tonight's agenda since that meeting was not scheduled at our regular agenda setting committee meeting date and time and I had other previous schedule conflicts and again welcome glad everyone's here thank you and trustee de Serpa. thank you thanks everyone for being here tonight um, I want to thank our colleagues in Monterey County for their continuing advocacy efforts on behalf of our families in the Pajaro, as well as um, our colleagues here in Watsonville. Thank you very, very much for um, advocating for our families. I know there was a town hall meeting last night that was very heated, and people really want to get back into their homes, and, um, and we don't blame them. Um, 
I want to thank, uh, in particular, a retired teacher from Pajaro Valley who had a long and illustrious career with us at Pajaro Middle School, Margie Jennings. She was a PE teacher. She's a wonderful human being, and she's raised $30,000 for the kids and families, um, particularly um, for Pajaro Middle School because they are displaced from their school and now sharing a campus with Lakeview. So um, I'm helping um, create a very special gift on behalf of the kids there, and um, we'll be uh, unveiling that soon. So thank you, Margie, for all of your efforts. Um, finally, continue to participate in um, meetings with Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance. And I was at another board meeting, which I, committee meeting, which I'm forgetting. So I'm sorry. That's it for me tonight. Thank you. Trustee Flores. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, this last couple of weeks, I also was able to attend the end of the intergovernmental meeting. Um, and that was um, really nice to see how all of the um, members of our community are coming together to make our community the best that it can be in talking about how we could help Pajaro. I um, also want to say I'm how proud I am of our city and how we've all been able to come together and help all those um, that have been affected by these floodings. Uh, myself and um, Trustee uh, Dodge Jr. were working together a couple nights out at the fairgrounds and um, it was really hard to see, you know, all the people coming in with wet feet. And um, so I just thank everyone who is doing their part to help anyone who's um, in need of, you know, shoes, clothing, diapers, food, all of that. There's lots of ways for all of us to help. If you want to know more ways, reach out to anyone up here. We'd gladly um, let you know how you can help. Um, I did get to do some rather fun things these last couple weeks. I was a judge for the invention convention at WCSA. I personally love invention convention and I hope to see you know all of our fourth fifth and sixth graders participating in that in PVUSD um, it's a great um, time for our children and I love seeing the excitement in their faces when they're um, explaining their inventions and how they came up with their ideas and so that was a really fun event um, I was also asked to be a judge um, for a cupcake contest which I gladly obliged that was for Pajaro Valley Little League and um, it was nice to see 280 of our PVUSD students out there um, enjoying the nice weather that we got that one day and ready to have a great season. So it was really excited, exciting to see that. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to extend um, Trustee Soto's regrets. Unfortunately, yesterday's high winds uh, took down several trees across the road uh, from his house and he is unable to leave his home. Uh, his road is completely blocked, um, and, but he extended his regrets and very much wishes he could be joining us this evening but is unable to be here. Um, I uh, went out to the fairgrounds on Friday with uh, Trustee Dodge Jr. and um, it's interesting conversations about you know, preparedness, about you know ways to you know streamline processes about just the chaos of initial responses of you know in the, in the face of disaster and also just what it means to come together as a community you know and just um, talking about the importance of school being a safe place and just you know the and just you know, had an opportunity to to talk to you know, our, our assistant superintendent of elementary and just the importance and I just appreciate what we're doing as a district to ensure that our students who are out there you know at the fairgrounds right now have a safe place to be and learn and know that they're safe um, so thank you to all of our you know classified staff to our, our, our certificated staff to our, our admin staff who are working tirelessly you know um, Especially for those, you know, who are displaced, you know, to ensure that, you know, our Pajaro Middle School students are integrated into the in the site at Lakeview Middle School. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. It's and, and welcoming. Thank you. Um, I also, you know, at the next agenda setting meeting, you know, we we have we we've we have a new board. 
right? You know, we have two new board members. We've, we've had a lot of, there's a lot to learn in that. So one of the things, we're, we will be discussing a couple of special board sessions, but one of the things I'm going to be recommending at the next um, agenda setting meeting is, is having a discussion around another, uh, another, another special study session, but again, around the Brown Act and around, you know, just to ensure that we are following proper procedures around discussions just so that we all have a good understanding of, of how to conduct the business of the board um, to ensure we're following proper procedure and everybody's on the same page on how to conduct that business. So we're going to go for that. All right. So that's uh, my comments for the evening. And we'll move on to item 3.5 and our high school student board representatives. And we have a video presentation from Aptos High School. Correct? New school? Okay. We have a presentation from new school. Excellent. Welcome and thank you. This is our slideshow for New School Community Day School. Lift up and never give up is This day, um, World Wetlands Day celebration, we basically did our fair share of community hours and we basically did like garden day and we just helped out the community. Also, the Clay Thompson organization had donated to us um, tickets to go see the Golden State Warriors game. Um, we have also finished the basketball season where every Friday um, for sports we go to the YMCA and we have games on basketball. Oh, oh. Start doing soccer. It's, uh, soccer starts um, next Friday. Month we have students of the month, and today, I mean, I mean, this month is Dominique Ortega and Diana Ar Arroyo. Arroyo. And every Friday, half of the school goes to a science workshop. And um, this quarter, I mean, last quarter we were doing guitars, <laughs> and this Friday we're gonna finish making our guitars. And uh, the rest of the other students stay at the school and do music and dance, sometimes art. And then we have Why Try, where in the mornings in advisory, we basically work on our self-esteem and basically like our mental health. We also have restorative justice training where the school makes a circle, and we just talk about different things. And each Monday and Tuesday in the morning, we also have Santa Cruz County Sexual Health Class, and basically covers like the basic sexual health class. Also, California Continuation Education Association, where our teachers go and they basically um, get to learn about different stuff. And our English teacher, Jody Richardson, is going to be presenting next month. We also have at New School our garden, 
and we had the opportunity to have Golden Love be there and guide us and basically give us a few tips on how to keep our garden thriving and growing. And we're looking forward to our 10th outdoor school and character development program where we basically go on different field trips and we basically work on like our social skills and learn plenty of new stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We do have a nap toss side. Okay. Okay, Renaissance. <laughs> keeping it real, keeping it fresh. We have Renaissance here. Okay. We want to try the Aptos High video again? Once more with feeling. Okay. Well, our apologies to um, the Aptos High students because we're having some technical difficulties, but um, I appreciate the time that you put into the presentation. Um, we will move on to item 4.1 then. Um, and if, uh, so our approval of the agenda, uh, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? make a motion to approve the agenda. I have a second. Second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 502. Um, moving on to item 5.1, approval of the minutes. Can I have a motion? A motion. I have a motion. Can I have a second? Second. Can I? So I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Motion carries 502. We'll move on to item 6.1 our proposed uh, comprehensive energy infrastructure renewal and power resiliency program amendment one. A report will be presented by Clint Rucker. Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. So as some of you may remember back in 2021, which seems like forever ago now, we actually did an RFQ to get energy services to help pro provide our sites with better, um, really green energy for our sites, as well as improving our costs, uh, improving cost savings throughout the district. So in 
back in 2021. We did do that in um, October of 2021. We brought to the board for Climatech, who's with me, Tyler Gertman from Climatech. Um, we selected them to be a partner with us and help us move towards more green energy across our district. In August of 2022, we brought forward to the board our first phase one, which included solar at Calabasas, as well as energy backups at Calabasas and Bradley, as well as um, some re redoing of our sensors, our controls, and our HVAC at our district office. Tonight, I have for you an amendment to that contract, so an additional, what we've call, called in the past phase two with the board. Phase two is now looking at what other measures can we put in place to help the district not only go green, but save energy as well. So at this time, we are proposing um, a few things. One is new solar PV shade structures at our district office. This is actually one of the biggest cost savings we'll see to our um, district as our district office is one of our biggest consumers of energy across the district. We're also looking at the potential of adding in EV charging stations at our district office so that the district can pursue purchasing uh, green vehicles in the future for some of our migrant programs as well as some of our delivery vehicles. And then we have LED modernization and lighting at, all, at 11 of our sites, as well as some exterior LED at six of our sites. The great thing is this actually uh, encompasses all of our trustee areas. So every trustee area will actually be getting some new LED lighting. And after working with Tyler and checking in, it'll also put all of our sites at LED lighting. So we will no longer be using the, you know, those fluorescent bulbs will be using LED, which will save us quite a bit. Overall, the life cycle savings is $18 million. In our first year, we should see general fund unrestricted relief of around $380,000. Just so the board knows, the reason we're bringing this back as we're still working with uh, Calabasas, everything's been going great. We've had a great partnership with Climatech. They actually let us know that this, recently the state has actually uh, changed the way that we get refunds on energy. So they did what they called net en energy metering. They used to have it as 2.0, they're moving to 3.0. So any projects that are actually approved and sent in for completion, prior to April 14th, will still be on this old 2.0. 3.0 would mean we'd lose about 25 to 30% of the savings. So we'd lose quite a bit of savings from actually moving to solar. So we're recommending to actually move forward this later in the uh, board meeting with an action item so that we can maximize our savings. One of the other great things in working with Climatech, we talked about the um, Inflation Reduction Act, which is a federal act that in the past did not apply to government agencies. So many of the board members who have been here, you may have heard we did power purchase agreements in the past. So we did those to be able to take advantage of these tax credits that we actually couldn't get as a government agency, which now with recent changes, we're able to access that. So while the overall project would be 5.7 million, we'd actually see about a 25 to 30% savings in terms of a refund after the project is complete. It's overall what we're looking at doing is of course, creating a more green school district, trying to save energy. The biggest, I think, most exciting thing, and I worked with Tyler on this, because um, it was a big push from Dr. Rodriguez, and I know a lot of the board. We actually, if we move forward from this with this later in the agenda, we will actually have the district office at net zero energy. So the district office will actually be providing all of its own energy for that um, building, which is always great news. It's what we're kind of looking at at Calabasas right now. It's really a huge uh, win, I think, for us. And again, just better for the environment and everything. I really, it's, it's been really a pleasure to work with Tyler on this. And again, we're just, for the public hearing, this is just for public to ask any questions or the board to ask any questions about the upcoming resolution. Thank you. Uh, do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. We have three. Um, and I'll call up all three if you could come up. Um, and also, if I mispronounce anyone's name this evening, please feel free to connect, correct me. Uh, Pam Sexton, Chris Webb, and Marilyn, is it Garrett? On item 6.1, that's the item we're on right now. Uh, this public comments at 7.1. Thank you. Each speaker gets um, two minutes. Thank you. Hi, I'm, um, I'm here tonight both as a teacher and also on this issue as a volunteer with Regeneración, Pajaro Valley Climate Action. And I just want to say what you know, but I think it, it 
is useful to repeat. It's, um, it's super important not just to think about going green because it's a nice thing to do, but the importance of making these transitions um, as soon as possible, like they should have been done already, um, because uh, people's lives are at stake. And this is, so we know that those who have least contributed to climate change are now the ones who are most impacted by it. And we can see that right here in Pajaro. Um, we know it's happening around the world. Um, South Africa right now is facing extreme storms and it's, it's directly related to climate change. So I appreciate one of the questions I was going to ask was um, when the district might get to net zero, net, carb, um, net zero carbon. And so that was um, nice to hear. I, I, actually, I think you just mentioned for the district office but I wonder for the district as a whole. Um, and I assume that you're working together with the um, 3CE locally on these things. Um, and yeah, that's, I just want to thank you and say it's an urgent matter. Um, and yeah, continue on. <laughs> Uh, good evening. Um, in light of recent climate, uh, well, recent weather disasters that I think you know we could maybe think are possibly climate change enhanced, I I I, I think this is great to see um, as a starting point at the DO, and then later to throughout the district. And I want to I want to reiterate something, especially since the Inflation Reduction Act came up. Um, the last time this item came up, I had I had suggested um, that we we adjust. The, the way we do our superintendent stipend for the, for the vehicle, switch it to a green vehicle. And I, I think that's still a good idea. Um, I think especially with the Inflation Reduction Act, um, there's savings to be had there. And then also if we did just have a, a district asset right there, um, if we could save costs over time. And before I had, I had mentioned the Rivian, as a truck, uh, as something you could carry around sandbags and you could go up high, wade through water. Um, I think that would still be good, but that would probably not qualify for the 7,500 tax credit. So, but it did come out as a car and driver 10 best, but there's another EV that is also a car and driver 10 best. You could do an, an Ionic. Um, so there's, I think we should consider doing that as a matter of fiscal savings. Um, it, instead of having that ongoing money of the 600, ish, whatever dollars it is, every month, if we in instead invested in a vehicle that would be a district asset, we could probably have some savings over time. So I think this is great to see, and I hope to see the solar and um, the sustainability push continue throughout the district. And also, I think it's important on the superintendent compensation point, because um, the superintendent's a leader, and they are a symbol of the district. So if they are going around in um, a vehicle of the future, I think that's, that's good for the district. Thank you. Marilyn Garrett. I taught in this district for 20 years and retired in 2000. And you notice I have tremors. My health provider believes it's from working next to fields of pesticides at a messy school. And also the microwave radiation from all these wireless antennas, Wi-Fi, causes similar neurological effects. So I wanted to explain why. I'm like this, likely. In terms of this proposal, it all sounds very good and very green, but is it really? How biologically harmful are these LED lights, for instance? 
you need to have someone here explain that because your primary obligation here is to provide a safe and healthy learning and working environment. And the LED lights, among other things, are a problem. In my own house, I still have some old incandescent lights, and I turn off the circuit breakers at night. Electro hypersensitivity is a growing problem from exposure to all this radiation and electricity. A book I recommend on that is called The Invisible Rainbow, A History of Electricity and Life. And that book documents each time there's been an increase in electrical pollution, there have been corresponding illnesses and increased mortality rate. So this is a problem in terms of climate change. I recommend a source, geoengineeringwatch.org with Dane Wigington on weather intervention patents. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any um, discussion from the board? Questions or comments from board members? I, I do. Um, I actually just recently started looking into solar, and I definitely learned about the new NEM, you know, 3.0, and it definitely is going to change the incentive to doing solar. So I And I was told the cutoff was April 1st, so I'm glad it's April 12th, but so it gives us a little bit of time. But, yeah, from the – if we get to it now, it's a one-to-one -one ratio when we have to buy back from pg e or um, any any overages that we go. But then after that, it's going to be a much larger, smaller, uh, the ratio changes not to our benefit. And so I definitely like that we're thinking about that now. Uh, Trustee Scow? Yeah, thank you for presenting this. This sounds great. A uh, great start. Thank the public speakers uh, who are also uh, commending this effort and the idea of uh, eventual greater partnership with uh, our Central Coast Community Energy, uh, Central Coast Clean Power. Um, those of us who live in unincorporated parts of our district in this county have often suffered from PG&E outages. And the more local energy we can we can generate, and the way we can look at our county, our school districts, and cities as partners in that, it's very exciting. So this is a great step in that direction. Thank you. Anyone else? Trustee DeSerpa? <clears throat> so just so I and the public can understand, so are we being asked tonight to enter into a new contract with PG&E or climate change, or what, what will happen? Yeah. So right now we have the public hearing for obviously questions from the public as well as the um, board. We do have a resolution to continue our work with Climate Tech because we brought a resolution before that was only focused on phase one. Each time we do this partnership with Climate Tech, we do have to create another resolution saying that we are going into this partnership where they will serve as our um, effectively as our liaison and our general contractor for all of our improvements. And again, that's what we did with Calabasas and Bradley and the DO before, and it's been working out great. So it will be in action item 9.2, I believe, what we'll okay, be actually, great. actually asking. Um, and so I, I heard you talking about the DO in particular, but did, did we look across the district to see other schools that could also benefit from this? Absolutely. So I talked to Tyler actually about that this morning as well as in the past weeks, looking at what about our other sites that don't have solar at this moment. So one of the things that um, Tyler and his team did for us was actually in this application, they'll include Pajaro Valley High School. As many of you know, anything at Pajaro Valley High School, we have to work with the Pilots Association and talk to them before we do anything. So if we weren't uh, to include Pajaro Valley in the actual application, they would, to Trustee Flores's point, be under that new NAM 3.0 where we would lose it. Thankfully, we are putting it in here. Since they're already doing the application process for the DO, they'll put it in there for Pajaro Valley High, so we have that option. Um, I've been in contact with the Watsonville Pilots Association to discuss this. We're actually working on setting up a meeting with myself, Tyler, and our legal to talk about the ability to put uh, solar as well at PV High in the future. There are other sites that could 
benefit from solar as well. However, the overall savings is much smaller because their footprint is much smaller. So what we're looking at with the district office is it's the best way to see as much savings as soon as possible. Those savings could, if the board desired in the future, be put towards more projects to create more solar because we'll actually be seeing savings immediately by going this route. And is the money for the project then coming out of the COPs? So we actually have three sources. One is general fund. It was already budgeted um, under general fund. And again, we'll see kind of that savings right off the bat to start reimbursing the general fund. We also have Measure L funding for across the district from our uh, Measure L for the entire district. It wasn't for one site, but for our district-wide improvements. And since this is hitting the majority of our sites, we'll be using some of that, as well as some of that OPSC or the Office of Public School Construction funding. We'll be utilizing some of that funding as well. And um, so for um, people's private homes, there's a giant, I heard you talk about this a second ago, there's these big rebates that people could get like up to, I think, 35% back on the cost of, of the whole project. Is that something similar? Did I hear 25%? I'll let Tyler speak a little uh, bit more to the IRA. Okay. Yeah, on the Inflation Reduction Act, both on a personal level and on a commercial solar, you can gain those benefits um, from them. And it can range from 6% all the way up to 70% in terms of your incentives. The federal government is still fine-tuning all the little rules and regulations because it's, this is the first time that public entities will have the direct pay option, which you can get the uh, incentives yourself. But in the range of 25 to 30% is a good estimate. It even could be higher that your district could get on the personal side too, just as a side, side comment. Um, when, they, when the CPUC did make the change to go to what they're calling a net billing tariff, which is also called NEM 3.0, they put quite a bit of funding, hundreds of millions of dollars, into residential battery storage and incentives for that. So on the personal side, definitely good to look at solar in combination with battery. And that was one of the um, elements that CPUC did politically to help drive more on the residential side for renewable and battery storage. So. So in terms of the rebate, so we put out a certain dollar amount and then we'll have that rebated in yep, cash? It'll be refunded. Like how, yeah, refunded over a certain number of years or all at once or how does well, it work? There's actually two programs that you could go through. It's the ITC, which is more of the investment side. If that's more of a lump sum funding right after the project is up and running and you fill in all the paperwork, which we would assist with. And there's also another program that's the production tax credit, which means that you would get paid over 10 years for the production of the system. They both kind of work out very similar, but you get more capital up front with the investment tax credit versus over a 10 year period of time. So you guys will have those options once the details are set in stone by the, by the federal government and the federal treasury. And then you guys can deem which refund you wanna go after. Great, so. thank you. Anyone else? All right, thank you very much. And I've got a procedural motion I'm gonna make real quick. I was just informed that our, our, our Renaissance High student is actually here and that our tech issues with Aptos um, High, the presentation was worked out. So I would like to make a motion that we briefly return to 3.5 <laughs> so we can hear those presentations. Can I have a second for that? I have a second, first and second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries 502. So uh, could I have our, our Renaissance High student uh, come up and can we have that presentation for Renaissance? Good afternoon, my name is Juan Mora and I'm a student representative for Renaissance High School. All right, this month for our school, we didn't have any students of the month, uh, the month due to weather reasons and school being canceled. Uh, sports, uh, for our basketball team, we had a pretty solid season. We went three and five and we got a win in the semifinals, but unfortunately we did end up losing in the finals to Seaside, and that's with back-to-back -back games, so we were tired. Um, we did earn second place in the league, though, and now we're looking forward to having a soccer season. 
which hopefully can happen. Me and uh, a lot of students, a lot of seniors from our school are really hoping to have one. Uh, after being told that, well, we can't really have one because we don't really have a field, and it's like dangerous to play in like those, those conditions that the field has. So uh, we're hoping that you guys could like fund us or something to like have a, be able to rent like at Pajaro or like indoor, any other place, any field, so we could get the opportunity to have our final soccer season in high school. Our academics, we're doing some aspect testing and they just got postponed a bit due to the weather conditions and school being canceled, but we're starting to continue it. Um, we got the return of after school program, which a lot of us students are really excited for. Uh, which we have PE, English, Math, and Ingenuity. Uh, for, for our CAS testing, we're pretty much 90% completed with it. And we did reclassify two students prior to the LPAC testing. And recently we've been having, so far in our school, we have 22 total graduates. And there's a couple of the names there. All right, thank you guys for having us and giving us opportunity to talk to you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Got our Aptos High working now. Good evening, school board members and superintendent, Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Chase Shock Mains senior class president here at Aptos High School and a school board student representative. Thank you so much for your time and for your interest in Aptos High School events. In the arts, Aptos High School has raised 8,968 meals for Second Harvest Food Bank and received the Hunger Hero School Spirit Award. In addition, a Santa Cruz County art exhibit is planned in the Santa Cruz Government Center. Dates are to, to be determined, but Aptos High School will be bringing art to the event. The Aptos High School, no, the Aptos Grange Small Business Fair for the National Art Honor Society has a sponsored exhibit and sale from April 29th, 11 to 4. AP Art students are also creating the backdrop for the Santa Cruz County Fashion Teen Steam Expo, which has been rescheduled to this Friday, the 24th at the Rio Theater. Congrats to these students and their teacher, Veronique Marks, for their incredible work. In spite of illnesses and bad weather, we at Aptos High presented our newest musical, Head Over Heels, to enthusiastic audiences in February. Also in February, the theater arts and drama production classes took a field trip to San Francisco to see the Broadway musical Mean Girls at the Golden Gate Theater. The drama department is currently working on a new comedy, Radio Days, to be presented in mid-April. This comedy, comedy is set at a radio soap opera in New York City during World War II and has plenty of comedy, action, and funny scenes. Be sure to check it out. Additionally, we are very proud to announce that some amazing Aptos High students have won a local video contest put on by Your Future Is Our Business. A big congratulations to Kenzie Smith, Monreve McGuire, and Karina Kessler. Here's some more about activities at Aptos High School. Our migrant debate team took third place in a competition at Salinas. Our Red Cross blood drive is happening on March 31st, and we already have more than enough donors. And Five Star Tuesdays are coming once a month on March 28th. Spring Fever Spirit Week ended successfully. There was no dance or cheer team at our rally, but we had a beautiful performance by Ballet Floplorico, led by Nancy Lejes, and, perform and a performance by Spanish teacher Mar Martel Mora and Synergy Specialist Albert Lambert. We also held our first ever Noche de Baile last Friday. The Roaring Twenties prom tickets are selling. Currently over 300 tickets have been sold for the April 21st dance at Coconut Grove. Hi, good board representatives. My name is Emma Lane and I'm a student board rep for Aptos High School and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about our athletics currently going on. 
So after a very fun and exciting fall and winter sports season, spring sports are now in full swing all over campus and every facility is in use every day after school. Our spring sport offerings include baseball, beach volleyball, boys golf, boys and girls lacrosse, softball, boys tennis, boys and girls track and field, and boys indoor volleyball. We have almost 400 students competing in our 10 spring sports programs, which brings us to over 800 students involved in athletics this year alone. This helps provide a positive energy on campus after school for games and practices in what we like to call the last class of the day. We are also very proud to announce that we have officially added three new girls sports at Aptos over the last two years. Last year, beach volleyball and this year girls lacrosse have each officially started competitions in the Central Coast section and have nearly 70 girls participating between the two sports. Additionally, in the fall of 2023, along with the CIF and CCS, Aptos will be adding girls flag football, both at the varsity and JV levels, as an additional opportunity for students on campus. Thank you. Thank you, Aptos High students. All right, returning to our regularly scheduled programming. Um, item 6.2, uh, Resolution 222339, uh, temporary borrowing between funds for fiscal year 2023-2024. Report uh, will be presented by Clint Rucker, our Chief Business Officer. Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. So every year we bring forward three different resolutions for borrowing. This is one of them. This resolution actually does require a public hearing. So this is the public hearing for the public to be able to see the resolution being presented to the board and for approval later this evening. This resolution is to allow borrowing between our own funds. Specifically for us, that typically is our bond fund and then our general fund. To be clear, just as this often comes up of the question of is this a sign of financial distress? Is this a sign of that we don't have the capital cover expenditures? It's not the case. This has, this has more to do with cash timing than necessarily do we have the cash. So um, for the board members who know, um, I know you're aware of how we receive most of our allocations. For the new board members, the majority of our funding comes at two times. And those two times you can probably guess, which is tax, property tax time. So we see a large amount of cash in December and a large amount of cash in April. So between the months of April and December, as well as December and April, going through a fiscal year, we tend to see dips in our cash only because of the fact that we haven't got those large allocations from the state. Once we get those allocations, we're typically fine and don't need to borrow. Um, in the past few years, due to the fact that um, we had some additional ESSER funding, we actually didn't need to always utilize these actual resolutions. However, they're more of just safety that every district puts in place so that when the state does have delays in allocations, we have a way to continue to pay the bills and continue to pay our employees. So again, this is not anything that's abnormal. We do this every year. It is just to allow us to continue business and be able to work and have the flexibility of where we can draw cash from. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Do we have any discussion from the board? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we will move on to our visitor non-agenda items, item 7.1 via public comments. So this is an opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda. And as I say every time, this is, um, you know, please know that although the Brown Act does prohibit members of the board from engaging in discussion for non-agendized items, just know that we are listening. So do we have any public comments? Yes, we do. We have 14 this evening, and um, I again will call on the names in um, by three. Please come up um, in that order. And again, if I do mispronounce your name, please feel free to correct me, and each speaker gets two minutes. Um, Maria Rosas, Bill Beecher, and Chris Webb. Good evening, members of the board and Superintendent Rodriguez. My name is Maria Rosas and I am here today as a teacher, PVSD parent and alumni. I'm here today to speak regarding the recent denial of a 4.5% wage increase to our administrators. I have been witness to their work ethic, passion and perseverance. During the past two years, at least one of my administrators at, at the site that I work on has had to teach 
a class and do their administrative duties. If I was in their shoes, I don't know if I would be a PVUSD employee next year since you've essentially given them a pay cut given the current inflation rate. Food prices alone have risen 7.8% over the past year, as well as basically all other essential needs. You may be surprised that I am speaking on behalf of administration while our teacher contract is being negotiated. I will not, and urge others not to, play into your divisive rhetoric. It will not be them versus us when it comes to having a livable wage. Education is a very demanding job regardless of the area that you specialize in. Administrators deserve a raise as well as teachers and classified employees do. I know you are aware of the current teacher shortage. In fact, today there were 35 credential and two admin positions posted on a on a joint. Administrators have had th uh, to lead schools that are not fully staffed, often taken on the tasks of vacant positions. How are you going to attract employees when your actions are showing them that you do not value them? In fact, on September 9, 2022, this very board passed resolution number 22-23-11 proclaiming week of the school administrator. Sorry. <laughs> in which you stated that the average administrator has served in public education for more than a decade, and that such experience is beneficial in their work to effectively lead public education and improve student achievement. You also stated that school leaders depend on a network of support from school communities, which include the Board of Trustees, to promote ongoing student achievement and school success. Finally, you stated that the future of California's public education system depends upon the quality of its leadership. Was this resolution just for show? If you actually meant what you wrote, then do what is right by our administrators who do the very hard job and demanding job of leading our schools and approve their very much deserved pay raise. Thank you. Good evening, Madam President, Dr. Rodriguez, staff. Um, this is a school board meeting, so I thought maybe a history lesson might be a thing to do. Ten years ago, this district was rated at 12th percentile in academic performance. Today, we're at 50 percent. I think this is due because of the hard work of the administrators, and thank you for commenting about that work. During the COVID-19 shutdown, our district's academic performance did not drop. Most districts in this state and across the nation did drop, some of them badly. The number changing subjects, the number of new teachers graduating every year has decreased for over 15 years. A math teacher at a past board meeting said we're losing 8% of our teachers each year, but we're only able to hire 3% back in. That's a net loss of 5% or 50 teachers a year. This problem is not just PVUSD, it's a nationwide problem. Your duty as a board is to work with the administration and PVFT on how to teach with fewer teachers. There aren't enough teachers. This probably means rethinking how we teach. Perhaps what we did during COVID-19 could be a teaching moment. What do you do next year when we're down 100 teachers or 150 teachers the following year? Now, I believe in rewarding good performance, so don't hold back raises for your administration or suggest that their pay should be cut. Thank you. Uh, I actually want to commend the board for their decision at that last board meeting. Um, because I, 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 I agree with supporting people who are doing a good job too, but not everyone has. And sometimes we follow leadership down the wrong path. And the, the administrators who are doing that have made life at Renaissance and other sites very difficult. So I'd like to do a little history lesson of my own, a reading from the 2018 WASC report, which was the last year that Renaissance had a successful WASC and it was our last year's model continuation school. <laughs> Areas of strength for standards-based student learning instruction. The school has a level program and students can move up and down levels depending on their credit earning, be behavior, and attendance. You, another section, using assessment to analyze monitoring and report student progress criterion. Students and parents are informed of individual students' academic progress as they transition through the level system. Our last administrator, um, under the mistake, the misinformed um, guidance, I believe of you, Dr. Rodriguez, um, 
got rid of that. And uh, as a result, in one of the last FAQs, we saw question seven was a, from a parent reporting about how her student uh, didn't want to come to school anymore. That's the culture that is has come from the absence of that kind of regular progress monitoring and support. So I think um, the idea and th those administrators who who carried out those those orders, they've since left the district. They broke something and then they walked away. And in the meantime, we the teachers who are dedicated, as we're struggling to to keep up. Like our the student here was was late because I didn't have the time to pick him up and drive him over here this time. And I didn't have as much time because grades are due for me. So like my actual regular teaching duties had to kind of take priority over the extra work I would normally do. Like those are the kind of things we need to keep in mind when we let um, people who maybe have a, a fancier title make the decisions, but they don't always know what's the best at the site. Thank you. And our next three, it's um, Diana Nickel, Pam Sexton, and Manuel Serrano. going to pull up my notes here. Uh, I'm not feeling well tonight, so I apologize uh, for trying to really wanted to talk a little bit about. Diana, um, can you speak into the microphone, please? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, Diana. Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> it's cutting out. An ability to last until Action 9.16, which is about the rate category two network installation projects. Um, but I do want to comment about related items to that. You know, um, as you know, that that's to put in wireless network uh, in Aptos High to be a hub for many wireless uh, activities. So I want to talk to you tonight about a recent landmark court ruling in a case brought by Children's Health Defense against the Federal Communications Commission. This is a August, I have the court opinion here. This is a court of appeal opinion in the um, United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. And they basically ruled that the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, which has been, um, you know, the regulator for wireless for decades, um, this court ruled, um, um, you know, it's a 40 page decision, but I'm just going to cut to the chase here if I can find it. Excuse me. <laughs> um, er, the commissioner's failure, the FCC commissioner's failure to provide a reasoned explanation for its determination that exposure to RF radiation at levels below its current limits does not cause negative health effects, renders the order arbitrary and capricious in three additional respects. And one of those, I'm going to read right now. The commissioner failed to provide a reasoned explanation for brushing off record evidence addressing non-cancer related health effects arising from the impact of radio frequency radiation on children. Two minutes. Okay, so just want you to consider that because the FCC is a captured agency. We don't, so when you put in the wireless hub, Thank you. And when you put in the wireless hub at Aptos High, it affects people. I suggest you go wired that and you use that measured L Your money up. for wired. Thank you. Hi, sorry, I'm um, back and I, I don't mean to speak too much, but I wanted to um, thank you for at the last, uh, I think it was at the last school board meeting, which I did not um, attend, I know that you passed a resolution that this week is adult education week. And I am an adult education teacher. And <laughs> let's hear it for adult ed. Um, like I know in the resolution you, you recognized um, the importance of adult ed, and it serves not just the students who come into my classroom, but it serves their kids, it serves um, their families, and, um, and it's really important. 
And I just wanted to remind you, I know this has been brought to your attention before, but adult education teachers um, do not get paid prep time. So any prep that I do for my class, which is quite a lot, because I love my students and I love to be a good teacher, any of my prep time is on my own clock. Um, we're dedicated, um, but it's been a long time that we've had no prep time, so that's one of the things that we're, um, we're looking for in the current negotiations. And I also wanted to speak on one other th issue in my time, um, lifelong learning, um, ECE to adult ed in this district. And I've written to, to you, and thank you, I heard back from a few. I really want to give my strong solidarity to our ECE workers who are living basically at minimum wage and, and just make it emphasize how critical what they give is. There's this archaic idea that, that early childhood educators are babysitters. They're not. They're doing the, the frontline core work that helps all of the grades that follow them. Lifelong learning. Hello, um, Manuel Serrano, uh, Watsonville Children's Center. I want to tell you that I have 47 students, and 47 students, and there's a lot of students. But um, we celebrate every day. Um, uh, for example, today is my birthday, and we celebrate my birthday with my students, and I talk with them about, I invite them to come in the circle time and share about their birthdays. And I talk to them about what does that mean to be one year old, two year old, three, four, five, and I tell them that they're ready to go to kindergarten because they know how to write their name, they know the colors, they know the numbers, their shapes, many of them are bilingual, better than me. And, and I do a lot, um, curriculum, like emerging curriculum, uh, because we're in crisis and the emerging curriculum is very important. Even though sometimes my administration wants me to follow exactly what is the mass production of education. But I do this because it's very important. And also, for 20 years, I have been accepting any invitation for any birthday party because I want to treat my, all my students with respect and dignity, and I don't want to make anybody different. And for 20 years, I have not accepted any birthday party, sorry. But um, that's what I do. And, and I do this because I believe that we need to be neutral sometimes with all the students. And I'm here because I want to ask you, please consider race for the early childhood educators, and also, I learned that some of my administrators, in lower levels, they make less money than me. And it's incredible. But thank you so much, and thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Our next three are um, Marta Balayic, Bridget Felder, and Megan Scott. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Marta Balayic. During the February 28th Watsonville City Council meeting, Saba Charter School Principal Josh Ripp maintained he would enforce the city's prohibition on student drop-off and pickup activity on Highway 129. However, Saba wasted no time in violating this policy and another policy. The very next day, Saba used both Highway 129 and its highway access driveway for student loading. Two Monterey County Office of Education buses were chartered by SABA for a field trip, transporting 80 students. At approximately 3 p.m., the two buses dropped off students along the shoulder of Highway 129 in a 45-mile-an-hour zone in front of the Golden Brands Building, located at 270 West Riverside Drive. There were no flashing red lights on the bus, nor did there appear to be a bus driver directing student traffic. SABA students disembarked and entered the SABA campus on the Highway 129 access driveway. In the February 28, 2023 City Council Agenda Packet, City staff set forth conditions 27 and 29 forbidding the use of Highway 129 for student drop-off and pickup and SABA Highway Access Driveway for student use. Both of these conditions of approval were ignored and violated. Although the Monterey County Office of Education provided the buses for the hazardous drop-off and pickup procedure, that office has thus far stonewalled on providing the designated drop-off and pickup addresses for that day. 
SABA's reckless student drop-off and pickup protocols pose ongoing threats to students, neighborhood stakeholders, and all drivers using public roadways. The dangers posed to the community are unprecedented for any school in Watsonville. SABA continues to be a detriment to the neighborhood. Here is a copy of my letter to the Watsonville City Council detailing SABA's ongoing safety violations. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm here again on behalf of the parents at Virtual Academy. I'm feeling increasingly frustrated that we're not being acknowledged or taken seriously about our desire to find a way to continue our children's education through VA. I know that you might feel that we're just a couple of parents whose same faces you see here every other week, but we're representing a larger group of parents that are unable to make it here for the meetings. I provided a survey last month that reflects some of the other parents' feelings and concerns, as well as their important reasons for sending their kids to VA. I'm not understanding why no one is addressing this issue or communicating with us. There is no response to emails, nor is the topic being added to the agenda at subsequent meetings. I would like to reiterate that we only need one teacher for the K-5 classes, and I'm unsure as to why that's not able to be accommodated, considering we are already an accredited and functioning, well, I might add, school that has been funded for several more years. Dr. Rodriguez herself was quoted in the Pajaronian saying, launching the online academy, on the other hand, estimated at just over 1.9 million will be cost neutral since no facility is necessary and the district can use existing per pupil funding. We're wondering what's changed. When this was published, parents were then also considering leaving the district if this was not going to be an option. Why were they accommodated then and we aren't now? We're here for the same reasons that parents were when this was published. Each meeting I have attended, I am hearing these overtired and overworked teachers come and express their need for help, support, and better pay, and it feels like all of this is just falling on deaf ears. Why would you suggest piling on more students for them to try and accommodate when we have them currently enrolled in a program that works for us? There's no need to further stress the already exhausted in-person teaching staff. This program is one of the only schools where you will find not only the parents and kids, but also the faculty happy. There are no known complaints from the teaching staff or families. We have proven ourselves and our test scores and we will do whatever it takes to stay open. Instead of pushing us into a failing in-person format or a charter school with lower test scores, why not allow us to stay open and absorb some of the workload from the other systems that are struggling currently? We have shown that our children are succeeding. Please, please don't take this away. Us parents don't give up easy. <laughs> We're trying to get the VA to stay open. One teacher for 35 students. Four teachers got reassigned on the 15th to different schools. I don't think four teachers is really going to help your teacher crisis. But hopefully, you know, you guys will let us keep one teacher and that will take care of 35 students. Our students are doing really well, and we don't require much. Us parents get time to bond with our children over teaching. We have help from the teachers if we need it. The teachers are there to guide us, but we only need one. We're not asking for very much. And I think that it's gonna be really sad for these children to leave each other. They're very attached to each other. They made their own little family. They go online to meet just to meet. We meet outside of school just so they have time to meet. They enjoy going to school. That's the bottom line. How many kids can say they enjoy going to school? They want to be with each other. Their structure is working for them and working for our families. You were talking about low-income families. This is great for low-income families, for kids that are displaced. A lot of schools shut down last week due to weather. Our school stayed open. We know exactly what to do when the weather's bad. We know nothing changes for our students. Everything's consistent. We just really 
hope you guys reconsider and just give us at least one teacher for 35 students. Our next three speakers, Anthony Felder, um, Barbie, uh, Bobby, excuse me, Marshalt, and Jorge Rojas. Good evening, board members. So uh, let me just start off by saying every other week I'm here fighting for my daughter's future and nothing changes. And there's no real good explanation why you need to close the VA. I just want to know why we can't have at least one teacher. Exactly what Megan said. <laughs> With uh, so, anyways, we just need one teacher to continue this very successful program. And it's uh, it's kind of beyond me how you guys would cancel a program where kids are excelling. And uh, on another note, during these past couple of weeks, with all the flooding that is happening, several schools were put online during, during that time because it works. So uh, VA doesn't get disrupted because we already using the program that we're already online. So therefore, like Megan said, also no distraction. Um, so VA was never su supposed to be a temporary thing. It was designed to be an alternate program for people who did not want to plan or people who did not plan to return to in-person for many legitimate reasons, COVID, whatever, name it, you name it. Um, and last week, 10 teachers and faculty members received reassignments, reassignments showing us parents that are pleased to keep our school are not being heard. There's 35 children in the K through five grades that may not seem like very many kids for you to consider keeping a school open for, but that is 35 families that are being harmed by this decision. That is not a small number. However, all we need to be able to accommodate these 35 children is one teacher. And I don't think that's a whole lot to ask of. Um, so if you guys would reconsider again and uh, keep our school up, and that would be great. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, Bobby Marchesalt, teacher and parent here in the district. Uh, good to be with you. I'm one of those people who doesn't make it out every time, but uh, who Trustee Scow was talking about that I, I am often following along on uh, YouTube. So um, first, I just did want to say thank you for your care and communication over the storms in the past week. I know our community has gone through a lot. You all have uh, gone through a lot and just appreciate compassion. And also, I think the communication from our office has been uh, is one of the, uh, the strengths, uh, hearing, knowing what's going to be happening, what's coming. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I know there's several teachers at our site who also have expressed gratitude for um, the after school pay that teachers are getting to, to be involved. And thank you for recently continuing that for our summer school. I know we're hopeful that you will also uh, keep it, if at all possible, for next year as it provides a rate that actually makes our teachers feel valued in the work that they're doing after school. And uh, they have measurable positive impacts on the students' performance. As a teacher, um, I know much of our school board has talked recently and ran recently on the importance of making sure that our teachers keep their prep time. And so I'm kind of dismayed and disappointed that I'm hearing that we're struggling to get any language in our new contract to protect that prep time. Uh, you know, I sit and listen and last week I'm like, oh, maybe I should have come, but I was tired, <laughs> I was at home, uh, had stuff I wanted to say. And then the next day I went to school and many of us had to, had to sub on our prep time the, the next day. Uh, it's happened since and we already know it's happening again tomorrow because the teacher's gone. And uh, I know the morale killer that is on our teachers and honestly, I know that there's other campuses that have it much worse than our site because I've talked to friends. And so I can't imagine what it's like uh, across the district. So just really want to advocate for that. You know, some of the passion that I heard uh, defending people a couple weeks ago in the meeting, I would love to hear that for our teachers, even just to hear, hey, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to find a way to keep your prep time. Um, even with the raises on the table, you know, our salary rates will still struggle to attract and retain teachers. And that's part of why the whole package is so important. What will improve teacher retention is teachers knowing that they will have prep time, that they'll be honored for bilingual skills, which they use regularly to help staff and families, and they have a district that recognizes that class size Bobby, does have an effect on student outcome minutes. and teacher satisfaction. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Good evening, uh, Superintendent Dr. Rodriguez, cabinet members, uh, school board trustees. My name is Jorge Rojas uh, and a recently separated service member as an officer with the Family Readiness Program. And I come before you because I'm following the chain of command. I have made several calls, requested a meeting, a uh, phone call to discuss an MOU that was made between the uh, Pajaro Valley Unified School District and a nonprofit organization known as Activities for All, which is run by one of your employees. And so I looked at this MOU and I found a lot of ambiguity. Uh, for example, it said that they are supposed to be using uh, the facility, which is a turf at EA Hall, on Sundays, every other Sunday. And it's uh, right now, from my understanding, it's uh, being reserved till May 28th. And the reason why I come before you is because I'm representing the community of Watson Mill, which is about 600 displaced uh, children that belong to your district that have no place to play. Why? Because this organization has a lock on it without allowing anyone to get on the field because of this MOU. So I wanted to change th that because it doesn't make any sense why it's uh, not being used for our kids that should be there during, for practice and on the games. And then on Section 5, it says that this uh, term shall uh, not commence more than five years. But uh, the... MOU has it that the organization shall have it from January 1, 2022 to December 31, 2027. So that really is more than five years. Um, it talked about a termination clause that any act by A4A unreasonable exposing the district to liability to others for personal injury can be a cause for termination. A uh, person placed the lock by, uh, on his own on a Saturday causing their kids to jump over the fence, which posed a liability for the district. Another thing about Section 16, insurance insurance requires you to have $2 million liability. Hoping this would pl be placed on the uh, agenda as an uh, action item, but I will pursue this. Thank you. Thank you. And our last two um, speakers under public comment, Marilyn Garrett and Donna Lefevre. And I'd just like to note that we um, did receive another um, card, but it was after item 7.1 had started. And um, speaker cards do need to be in before that item is started. So that one won't be um, asked to come up. That's a rule that discourages and censors people from speaking. Every other city council meeting or school board meeting I've been to, people get up and they address the item, including the board of supervisors. That's a discouraging rule you should remove. It's, it's outrageous. Education, not radiation. Education, not microwave radiation. I will leave you with a medical advisory, Wi-Fi and Children's Health. International Agency for Research on Cancer of the World Health Organization classified radio frequency electromagnetic fields emitted by wireless communications devices as type 2B possible carcinogen, possible cancer risk to humans. The WHO report advised the, uh, the public, particularly young adults and children, to, quote, take pragmatic measures to reduce exposure, as, as affirmed by Dr. Robert Bond of IARC, this classification to be possible carcinogenic is not limited to cell phone radiation, quote, it holds all types of radiation within the radio frequency part of the electromagnetic spectrum, including the radiation emitted by base station, antennas, radio TV towers, radar, Wi-Fi, smart meters, other commonly known carcinogens under T 2B classification include lead, DDT, mercury, etc. And I will also leave you with this attention all parents. Thank you. That was too is Wi-Fi making your child sick? 
and have parents given informed consent to this exposure. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Donna Lefevre. <clears throat> I'm a math teacher at Watsonville High School. Um, as a trained professional, I know that when you notice that um, the information hasn't really gotten through, it's important to revisit. So we're looking at um, a visual that I provided with the board. Last time we have some new people, so you get to see my visual again. Um, all right, you get to see my visual for the first time. Um, this is a breakdown of why prep is important. And so there's some basic things of what's required for us to do to have a success successful lesson to provide the kids with the learning that they deserve. Um, it's also absurd that uh, adult education teachers aren't paid for their prep time. Teachers are required to have prep time. Um, so that's just something that we really need to consider. Also, I've already lost my prep this week on our little sub-rotation list. Um, it looks like I'm probably gonna lose it again tomorrow and we have grades due. So how am I supposed to get this done? Already we don't have enough time. How am I supposed to get this done? So. Um, it's really, really important that you take this seriously, that you stop taking away the time that teachers need to provide this learning that the kids are craving. They're in there. They want to be there. They want to be there in person with us. They want to have engaging lessons, and we cannot do it if you do not give us the time. And this is just, I mean, I'm saying five minutes to do all of these things. It doesn't take five minutes. Come on. Even we can um, agree that in the district office, um, when you're making copies, it's not going to take you five minutes to make copies. If you've worked with a copy machine, those things always break. So come on. It's, it's, we need the prep time. You cannot take it away. Um, the other piece is like we have to be paying for these day-to-day -day subs so that people will come and be substitutes in our district. If we're not paying that money, then it's not, we're, we're going to be stuck losing our prep time all the time, and that's in, having huge impacts on the learning in the classroom. Um, so I just really want to urge you to look at that language. We shouldn't be um, required to sub in any capacity, uh, but if we're looking at the language that's in there, it says reasonable basis, and this is not reasonable. Losing my prep in the same week on when grades are due is not reasonable. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to item eight, our employee organization comments. So now is the time that we hear from our employee organizations, and each will have five minutes. So we'll start with uh, Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Good evening, board. <clears throat> I want to start first by saying that we are really saddened by the tragic impact um, that the Pajada Levy breaking has um, had on our families and our students. Uh, and I want to say that um, thanks to all the organizations that rushed to um, help and to um, uh, some of our teachers who also immediately rallied and um, volunteered, uh, I got to see the um, we, had a, we have a couple of teachers that speak Misteco, and they were um, such a valuable asset to um, the, the fairgrounds evacuation site when, when they showed up and helped many, um, many families with translations. <clears throat> we also want to thank Lakeview for welcoming Pajaro staff and students to their site. I've been out there several times, and things are going well. Uh, <laughs> there's just so much to say, and I only have very little bit of time. Educators, we're strong proponents of what students deserve. So you heard, you, had, you heard what I had to say on March 8th, I hope. But we rally for what students deserve. They deserve a fully staffed school site with certificated educators and supports <clears throat> so that, to guide them through their learning journey. We are, we, our special needs students deserve to receive supports from those qualified um, educators and support systems. But instead, the district proposes to increase caseloads for teachers working with children with autism, preschool children with autism. How is that helpful? IEPs, individual education plans for the public, those are legal documents. And so our families with special needs children, I hope you're listening. 
uh, the district wants to impact a teacher's caseload. And that means that the time that they can address the needs for your student, for your child, is um, then also impacted. We're asking for an 11% increase. It's a 1% difference from what the district has offered, is willing to go. They keep telling us that the County Office of Education is, has told them that they cannot offer us more than 10%. So that's what we have been told at the table. The County Office of Education has stated that they will not approve a 10 per, greater than 10% increase to our unit. We also know that what we negotiate our CSEA brothers and sisters will also benefit from. So this is all important to us because we believe that what we fight for is for the good of our students. And our students feel it when we, when teachers and administrators are not at school. I stepped into the classroom last week to help out when teachers were um, stuck in traffic for many hours due to the roads being closed and only having one roadway in. I saw immediately the impact of not having a, um, a fully staffed support staff. The, the, our support staff are those, our custodians, our instructional assistants. As soon as I walked into the classroom, I can tell that that classroom had not had the opportunity to be vacuumed in a long time. That's what our students are walking into. They feel that. There's still upwards to, what, 10 classrooms at Watsonville High School that do not have a hired teacher this year. This is the second year in a row that Watsonville High School students do not have a hired certificated teacher. We have subs coming in. Many of our subs aren't trained in physics or in trigonometry. Um, and we have our teachers losing their prep and still expected to grade 175 papers, to enter you know, 175 grades into a grade system, to communicate with parents when the parents are asking for them to be com communicate with them, to, speak, to communicate with students, um, and so much more. Writing, our, our high school teachers especially, they spend time writing, around this time, writing uh, rep, letters of recommendation. So it's kind of like wage theft as well. So when you're asking the teacher to work outside of their contract time, we don't ask our support staffs at medical offices to take papers home and do the medical billing at home but, and not get paid for it. So we're asking for 11%. We believe that our students, that the district can find that 1% extra because that's what our students deserve. Um, our students also deserve smaller class sizes. All we're asking is for a reduction of two. Our schools, and this is for the fourth and fifth grade classes, um, fifth grades, and then whatever site that has like, an ele in, this is an elementary, so some sites do have sixth grade, and so that's inclusive of them. So from, they go from 24 students in um, third grade to 34 students in fourth, fifth, and then some sixth grade. That's an increase of 10 students, and our students feel it. I taught those grades as well. So 32, that's a reduction of two. I think our students deserve that so that they have that time from their, from their teachers. Um, <laughs> prep time, a cap on prep, that's what we want a cap on. We don't want a cap on health benefits, we want a cap on the amount of time that our teachers lose to, um, from their prep time. So we wanna put a limit on the number of times that they're asked to be, um, to step into another classroom during a month. Our students deserve that. So I just wanna point out what Mr. Beecher said earlier um, that you know, where he, give, he gives the, stu the district kudos of our students during that year that we were closed, that their scores remained the same. That was the teachers. And you know who negotiated that contract to make that happen? Thank you, we did. They went to school online half the day, and the other half of the day, they had teacher conferences. Thank you. So, Mr. I'm going to give some history. Really know it.
Do we have any public speakers for that? We do. We have three. Bill Beecher, uh, Roddy Kirkman, and Martha Vega. Good evening. Uh, thank you for that uh, wonderful, warm introduction. Um, yes, COVID-19. The real fact is this district put one heck of an effort into putting all that stuff online. That's the administration. The teachers executed well. It was a joint effort. So at the last meeting, I made a mistake. I told you that CalPERS had raised to 28%. I was wrong. Nellie was right. It was 19% plus. However, it does mean that our teachers got more than a 13% raise over the ten last 10 years. However, that retirement plan took all the money, and there was none available, that 13% available for teachers' raises. Now, the state budget is, has a shortfall, as we've heard, and the poor performance of the CalPERS investment portfolio is terrible. So we can expect to see rate increases in the CalPERS rate going forward. Now, also at the last meeting, a PVFT speaker told you how many teacher openings there were at some adjacent schools. Salinas High has 2,668 students, much less than PVUSD. So their teacher openings on a prorated basis are much higher than ours, actually more than three times higher openings than we have. This is true for the other districts that she mentioned. So her comments were misleading and dishonest. They were intended to make our district look bad in negotiating with PVFT. Shame. Now, bunches of budget numbers were also verbally presented. There was no presentation for anyone to check them or question their origin. That is shoddy. I can't check them. You can't check them. Clint can't check them. I expect better from PVFT. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, <clears throat> we are in negotiations, and I think you've heard um, both an adult ed member of ours and an ECE member come up and speak to you tonight. And so I just want to elaborate a little bit on what we are attempting to negotiate for those two units that we represent. You've heard me speak to this item before, but our ECE folks work on a poverty wage. Currently, our assistant teachers are making minimum wage. We actually had to adjust the salary schedule to meet minimum wage on January 1st. It is incredibly disheartening to hear that their own source of funding won't provide them a sufficient raise, um, and our district cannot work to do that with our general fund to lift up those members of our, our community because they are members of our community. Our adult ed unit serves the entire county. Um, as we heard Pam speak to, they do that without any compensated prep time. That is one of the biggest asks that we have gone forward with in their contract. Um, Mr. Beecher up here talked about Salinas Union High School District. They also have an adult ed unit. They serve about roughly 2,000 students, which I, I believe, and I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but I believe that's similar to what our district serves in our adult ed unit. Salinas Union High actually provides prep time to their teachers. We were told that our adult ed unit could not afford to do so. So I ask, why not? Why not? I also just want to speak to, I know um, a couple of people talked about the admin raises. Nellie spoke to our agreement with providing our administrators an minutes. increase at the last meeting. Thank you. Two minutes, right? Yes. 
Um, good evening. My name is Martha Vega. I'm a resident here in the city of Watsonville in District 2. I'm here today. Um, I, I worked for the city of Watsonville for close to 20 years, and I made a transition to do a career change. And it's heartbreaking to see what's been going on in our community regarding the flood. And I want to thank you, Alicia. I know you've been wonderful putting out information as well as the board showing that you care, attending events, working with various stakeholders to include nonprofit organizations, as well as our public safety teams, um, government officials to be able to put out the information through media to keep our community safe. Um, we had gridlock traffic with Highway 1, bo both northbound and southbound beat at gridlock. It forced everyone on Highway 129. What normally would take um, a short distance, it took over two hours or more. It impacted students, staff, um, and now we have individuals that are not only affected because of the flood, but they're, they're without a home. Um, we have individuals that are not going to be able to work the land um, because it's contaminated, it's real, um, it's heartbreaking, and that they're not earning enough money. Classified staff, teachers, um, and principals all deserve um, a raise. I have a niece. She uh, is no longer, she put in her notice two weeks ago. She's no longer going to be working with the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. She's a kindergarten teacher for Radcliffe, and she loves working with autistic kids, and it just doesn't pay enough. So yeah, I'm saddened to see that she's not going to be able to continue in our community. It's heartbreaking, and it's heartbreaking all the way around. Thank you. Martha. Is that it for public speakers? Is that it for public speakers? All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, so item 8.2, uh, California School Employees Association. Do we have any representatives from CSEA? Do we have anyone from Pajaro Valley Association of Managers? Good evening, President Holmes, members of the board, Dr. Rodriguez. It's actually my first time speaking up here. I've been in this for 24 years. First time I get to speak to you. Um, so I am the proud principal of Pajaro Middle School. And as you guys know, we had a couple incidents over there that did not allow us to go back to school. Um, last last um, Saturday, I was talking to many people who got involved and were trying to figure out what do we do with our students? How do we bring them back? And it's amazing how many members of the community are out there trying to help out Pajaro Middle School get back on, back on track. Um, Lakeview Middle School, um, under the leadership of Elaine Legareta, princ uh, interim principal, and Judy Woods and their staff, was started reaching out to Dr. Rodriguez and offering a space for us at Lakeview. Because uh, they had 14 spaces open for us. We spoke with our staff at Pajaro Middle School through a Zoom, and they're like, they wanted to stay together. Um, but we needed like 22 spaces or 23 spaces. And in a matter of 48 hours, Dr. Rodriguez made everybody available for us, which was beautiful. Um, M&O, uh, threw my shout out to my people who I know personally, Arlindo, Sergio, Saulo. We walked the premises on Monday morning um, at Lakeview. I had been there for seven years. Came up with a plan to divide some sections into classrooms, viable classroom, not small little classes, viable classrooms. And within 48 hours, we had 23 classrooms. Um, we had everybody on board, curriculum, instruction, um, on Leonardo Claudia and, and Tosas, walked the classrooms, made sure that we had enough, the, enough materials and curriculum for our teachers to come and be ready to teach. Our teachers showed up on Monday to try to organize their classrooms, have it ready for their students. Um, everyone was on board, and we turned walls that looked like walls into classrooms. Um, we had the um, tech department with Dan and G and, and Saul and Jason getting us the technology we need for teachers to teach. You know, um, we had every person possible 
all hands on deck. The people that put those walls up were there until one in the morning. Um, paint department was there on Monday night, painting at 10 o'clock at night, just to make sure that the students had somewhere to, somewhere to learn. Um, I talked to a couple of people that were helping wipe off desks and wipe off boards, and they said, we wanna make sure that when the teachers show up, they have one less thing to worry about. And our students, you know, the students need a place that's respectable for them to, to learn in, and it was done under a lot, a lot of, a lot of work. <laughs> Many long hours, this is L1. That was divided into two sections. If you continue, you'll see what, what came out out of those. And if you walk right now, it doesn't look like that. Um, spaces that didn't have, like I said, technology have technology. We have everybody in the district pushing and supporting to make this happen. Our staff is happy to be at Lakeview. We're very, very grateful to their staff for allowing us to be there, for walking with us. We had meetings with the students. They were a little bit nervous, but right now they're starting to fit in. Um, it's, it's been a lot of work. It's been a lot of 12, 14 hour days, but when you see the band play, it's um, good stuff. I'm very proud of all the work being done. I'm grateful to the, like, even the, the food service at Lakeview, right? Showed up, like I said, I worked there for seven years. Veronica's like, Juanito, how many kids you bringing? <laughs> I'm at about 447. So they went from serving students, about 440 students, to serving 880 students wow. the very, within two other days, all right? So, like I said, it, it's a group effort, and I know people say sometimes we try to divide, but this is a very unified, it was a very unified effort. Um, I can't thank everybody enough from my custodian, Haido, Matsuo, the custodians came over from Aloni, from Hall. Um, they were all out there. I know Peggy was out there. I know that Lisa always checked on me every single day. We have retired teachers, Jackie, um, who used to be a principal at, at Pajaro. They're out there volunteering, making sure transitions are fine. The kids are like, they're loving it, right? They still want to go back to Pajaro as soon as it's back, they're ready to go back, but they, they're excited to meet new kids. And we're, we're on, on an offset schedule. We start a little bit earlier so the kids don't really see each other. And because I was, there, I was there, the Lakeview kids are my kids, and because I'm a Pajaro, the Pajaro kids are my kids. So they're like, hey, when do we get to see your students? <laughs> I'm like, they're here, because you can't tell there's 880 students on that campus right now, because we have offsetting schedule. Um, and it's been beautiful to see the kids come back. I think at the very end, on Wednesday, when they came back, and the kids walked out, and there was a hug, oh my god, you're here, right? It was like you made it out, <laughs> and we're here. Um, so we had a joint meeting, we had, we had an assembly with our students to tell them how things were going to go, talked about perseverance and lessons to be learned from this experience. Um, Elaine Legoretta spoke with her students in regards to empathy and what it is to welcome one another as a community of Watsonville. So everyone pulls their weight. And, and like I said, st this stuff wasn't there eight days ago. This, none of this was there. Um, and so it's amazing how everybody pulled and did their thing. Um, I'm totally grateful, my staff is grateful. Um, I know that Rich um, Ariano made everything possible also with the opinion of whatever you guys need, make it happen. All these schools reaching out, Rio Del Mar, EA Hall, um, they're like, we getting, they're setting up our entire office here, what, what do you guys need? You know, it's colega con colega, right? friends with friends, helping friends. Um, I know you, you're the administrative secretary, I, I, got, I got you, I'm office manager, I have you, right? How, you guys need a coffee pot, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> coffee is important in the main office. And all that stuff is coming around. And now our school is also becoming, we call it a community school, right? We have people that are organizing donations, they're being, showing up, kids are being called out. And we wanted normalcy, normalcy for our students and we wanted to be sure who needed assistance. And now that we have it, we know who needs assistance. We're able to pull them out of class, we're to talk to parents, provide what they need. Thank so you so much. It's been great. And thank everybody, I appreciate all the work that's been done. Thank right. you. Do we have anyone from uh, Communication Workers of America? Not today. Okay. Thank you to all our employee organizations for your comments and your work. All right, we're moving on to our action items. Um, item 9.1, our mental health clinician and uh, school resource officer program. The report will be presented 
by Dr. Um, Ivan Alcarez, our Director of Student Services. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I am Dr. Alcaraz, the Director of Student Services, and I get the privilege of giving you an update on our SRO Mental Health Condition Program, as well as some data that we've been collecting this school year. Uh, just to get us started, a little bit about uh, the history uh, from previous uh, board approval. This was a, a board meeting in May that was held and approved the continuation of our pairing of the school resource officer and the mental health clinician with some recommendations for uh, the team. Uh, these recommendations included data collection, so continuing to log all of the interactions that our mental health uh, clinician as well as our SRO were having as part of this program as well as uh, surveying our families and students that had those interactions as well. In that recommendation, there is also progress monitoring, giving opportunities for students, families, and staff to give input as part of the, the process, as well as some cross-collaboration between the teams that were already in place. And that at that time, it was Aptos High School and uh, Waltham High School uh, for SRO Mental Health Clinician. We also wanted to document the process and procedures that our mental health clinician and our SRO were following in the event that we did need to hire a new mental health clinician or SRO so that there was some fundamental understanding of what that looked like at our sites. Uh, some training opportunities to include restorative practices and, and school-based interventions as we were embarking on our MTSS framework as well as our PBIS initiatives. And then lastly, to do some cross-collaboration with the uh, Waltham Police Department and the Sheriff's Department in Santa Cruz County uh, with our SRO assignments. So just, uh, just so that we note that these were the recommendations that the team has been following this um, school year uh, in trying to um, guide our, our practice and, and the things that we're doing at the site. So what I'm about to share with you, it's the interaction logs. Um, this is the data that was collected from August 15 to March 12th. Um, this is uh, uh, families and students that we actually uh, had some level of interaction at uh, Aptos High School or, and uh, Waltham High School. So look here at the, at the data, um, Aptos High School recorded total of 76 referrals, uh, while Waltham High School recorded 145 referrals. Uh, when you look at the per capita kind of percentage, it's kind of very similar, 5.7 for Aptos High School and 6.7 uh, for uh, Waltham High. Uh, something to note, our resource officer uh, for Waltham High School has been as assisting other sites. Um, oftentimes they do assist PB High School as well as other local uh, schools like Renaissance as well as some of our middle schools in the event that we do need that support and assistance. As well as Aptos High School, I know that they've been supporting our, our Aptos Junior High School in, in some types of events. Uh, those were not recorded on, these, uh, on this data report. These were more of just the support that was provided outside of Watonville High School and uh, Aptos High. A quick look at the referral source. So we wanted to track um, what, where these referrals were coming from. Uh, out of the 76 uh, total referrals, 54.5 uh, uh, of the referrals were initiated by the school administrator, while 33.8 were uh, referred by others. These are typically st uh, staff members like our teachers, our, our counselors, uh, perhaps some of our support staff at the site that may have encountered something uh, to make that referral. Um, you might ask yourself why uh, is 50 more than half of the referrals are coming from administration uh, typically are the the first line of, of, of response so if there's some type of event happening or incident at the school campus uh, your administrators are typically the ones who have that first encounter uh, that's not very different than uh, for Watsonville High School because of that uh, first response. Uh, is our administration, 62.5% of the referrals are coming from school administrators, while 336 are coming from other staff. So very similar data trends on this one. In terms of the grade level, uh, this is um, you know very common, and at the secondary level, at the high school level, 70.2% uh, were from ninth and tenth grade. Uh, if you look at the population, it is a little over um, you know 50% on Aptos High School, 54.8% uh, of Aptos student population. Right, so we try to figure out why uh, we want to try to make sure that those kind of align with each other, those percentages. But typically, um, you know, traditionally we do have um, um, a lot more referrals coming from 9th and 10th grade typically is the, the adjustment to a change of a new environment, right? So they're transitioning from 8th grade to 9th grade, uh, vice versa. There's some, some changes in their academics with more rigorous uh, coursework in 10th grade as well. So there's lots of factors that contribute to that heightened um, you know, behaviors uh, on campuses. Uh, similarly, at Watsonville High School, 57.9% were 9th and 10th grade, more, uh, more than half. And then more than half is the population at their site for 9th and 10th grade as well. 
In terms of uh, one of the data points that we're looking at and we wanted to continue to look at is whether the, the, the referrals were coming in from uh, students who had a, a special circumstance, whether they have a 504 plan or receive special services through an IEP. Uh, Aptos High School, 50.7% of the referrals that came in uh, did have uh, or were students that had a 504 plan to end or an IEP. Uh, just to note, the 19% of Aptos student population has a 504 plan or an IEP. Um, again, you might ask yourself why, um, the, you know, the response um, time in here, it, or sorry, the referrals are 50, more than about half of half the referrals are from students with the 504 plan or IEP. Uh, the reason here is one thing that we did take a look at is whether the referrals were coming in as more preventative, whether response, uh, and what we want to take a look at, and you'll see in later slides as we take a look at whether more of the, res of the referrals were from a response approach versus meaning they actually had a violation of education code or uh, more of a preventative measure, someone reporting something anonymously and then getting some support from the mental health clinician. So in this case, um, a lot of the referrals that were coming in were very more preventative seeking support for a friend or and or a an incident that required just more preventative uh, support at Watsonville High School 26.9 percent of the referrals came from students who had a 504 plan or an IEP the um, percentage for those who have a 504 plan or an IEP at Watsonville High School is 18.56 we are also tracking the um, ethnicity, right? So where are the referrals coming from? Uh, more than half of the referrals for the SRO mental health condition at Aptos High School came from students who identified as Hispanic or Latino. That's uh, 63.6%. Um, and then 27.3% were referrals that were from students who were identified as white. Again, you might ask yourself, what what is what? what is it the reason behind some of these uh, numbers or percentages what we take a look at here is again the preventative versus response and so um, on this one in particular about 20 percent of the referrals uh, so 11 out of the 49 referrals on hispanic war is in response to a violation to an education code that resulted perhaps in more of a more an encounter with the sro versus the preventative measures that was with the mental health clinician in this case which is about 78 percent of those responses uh, for Watsonville High School, the ethnicity breakdown, 92.8% uh, Hispanic Latino, just noting that their Hispanic population uh, at Watsonville High School is 95.6%. 4.6% 4 uh, 4 were from students who were identified as white, so that's very, it matches closely to the, the population at that high school. So when we looked at where the referrals, uh, how do we address the, the interactions or what is the outcome in terms of um, who is supporting that, that incident or that, that referral, at Aptos High School, 55.8% of the referrals were addressed collaboratively with the SRL mental health clinician. 41.6% uh, of the referrals were actually just addressed by the mental health clinician and 2.0. 2.6% of the referrals were addressed only by the SRO. And so this is uh, something that we like to see, right, because we do have this pairing of the SRO mental health condition is that we do want to see either the mental health condition doing that preventative work or collectively, uh, collaboratively with the mental health condition and SRO. So um, looking at these numbers for the SRO only um, are a positive thing on our end. Similarly, at Watamo High School, 73% uh, were collaboratively addressed by the SRO mental health clinician, 25% only by the mental health clinician, and then 2% only by the SRO. Uh, this is what I was alluding to as we we're looking at the violations or in terms of the incidents, whether it's preventative or a response uh, referral. Um, when we're talking about non-violations, typically are referrals that come in because there's a, a loss of, of a family member or loved one. Uh, perhaps it has to do with a, um, a, a suicide risk assessment that was conducted. Perhaps there was a threat assessment that was also uh, led to that referral. Uh, peer conflict was one of the, the, the top one referrals for Aptos High School. So 75% of the referrals were intended to be more preventative rather than uh, a response to something that was immediately happening at that moment in time that violated one of the education codes. Um, the top three referrals for um, Aptos High School that were non-violations, uh, more preventative, were peer conflict, victim of a crime, or social anxiety. 
uh, for those that were violations that are actually more response in terms of, of actually involving an education code, uh, were 25% of the referrals with mostly um, coming into the 4900A1 or A2, which is uh, physical altercations or, vi uh, or physical fights on, uh, in, in that regard. Um, similarly, for Watsonville High School, 62.2% uh, were intended to be more preventative rather than response, with the top three referrals coming for pure conflict, uh, victim of crime, or psych uh, social anxiety. Um, you'll see in there, um, there's a big one for mental health needs, so there's, again, there's more of that. Uh, either peer re referral system, self-referraled, and or others, uh, staff members referring to the mental health clinician and the SRO for some help and support. Uh, for Watsonville High School, in terms of the response, uh, there was about 33.8% of the referrals uh, were students who actually violated an education code or penal code. Again, very similar to the after high school th trend, it's the 4800A1 or A2, which are uh, addressing our physical altercations or uh, fights. For interventions provided, so we're not only looking at what are the referrals coming to us, who's, who's actually initiating the referrals, but we're also taking a look at what happens after the referrals and what are some of the common kind of supports or additional interventions that are provided post the assessment from the mental health condition and the SRO. Uh, for Aptos High School, the top three interventions included safety plan development, student parent conferencing, and repairing harm. Uh, so the, the safety plan is a very common step when there is, for instance, a threat assessment that's conducted at the site leading to need um, a, um, a safety plan. Um, it could also look more like a peer-to-peer -peer conflict that leads into creating a safety plan for both students. And so that typically is the top one for Aptos High School. Uh, for Watsonville High School, the top three interventions included the student parent conferencing, repairing harm, and referral to additional support. So the, the difference here at Watsonville High School is the referral for additional support. We do know that um, Watsonville High School does have a, a PBPSA case manager that is was assigned to them that is also supporting this process as well. So they're also, that's an additional support that is available, for instance, at Watsonville High School that may be as a referral mechanism for, for this um, program. So um, in addition to just a, um, you know, a looking at the referral system, the recommendations was to survey the families and students that actually had an interaction to kind of understand a little bit about their interaction with the SRO mental health clinician and kind of figure out if there was any changes that we needed to make uh, quickly. Uh, this was uh, done by every uh, Aptos High School and Watsonville High School identified a staff member who was reaching out to these uh, families post the interaction and or encounter with the SRO mental health clinician. Um, and we actually had 84 total responses. Uh, in here you'll see that 23.2% uh, were of uh, family members of a guarding of Aptos High, 23.2% were a family member of a guarding of Watsonville High School student, 23.2% uh, of student at Watsonville High School, and then 30.5% uh, were student at Aptos High School. And so the questions that were asked by this person who was initiating the survey was how they felt or if they felt understood during their interaction with the mental health condition in SRO. What we're looking is either strongly agree or agree, right? In this case, for that particular survey question, 73.8% of the responses indicated that they felt understood, they felt heard and understood during the interaction with the mental health condition and the SRO. Only 3.6% disagree or strongly disagree. Uh, for the question, I know what resources and or options are available to me to assist in my situation. To one thing that we want to make sure is our families and students are actually knowing how uh, to proceed post the interaction with the, with the mental health condition in SRO. And so we want to make sure that they understand uh, the resources available to them. 60.7% uh, ag strongly agree, agree, uh, while 9.6% disagree, strongly uh, disagree that they did not know uh, the resources available to them. We also asked just their overall uh, feeling about the interaction, whether it was, it was respectful, respectful and positive. Um, we did get an 82.2% of the response indicating that they strongly agree, agree to um, be respectful and positive, while only 4.8% disagree and strongly disagree. 
So I'm gonna that that kind of is our first uh, recommendation um, as part of the the approval for this year's uh, programming that included the interaction log and the uh, experience survey. Uh, we also did put out a survey uh, for our students. We put out a family survey as well as surveyed our staff in terms of their uh, thoughts and opinions about our ment uh, mental health condition and SRL pairing. Um, I do want to report that this year we actually had more engagement in responses than we previously had the previous year. So we actually had more parents responding to our survey, more students responding to our survey, and then our staff also re more responses. So um, kudos to our, our teams that were out there uh, trying to push the survey so that we get a good comprehensive understanding of the thoughts and opinions of our family, students, and staff. Uh, in addition to that, I did uh, have two focus groups, one at each site that was more open-ended questions. Uh, what we try to do is we did try to kind of uh, put themes around the questions and try to capture, encapsulate what the responses would, would look like for us. So for the student survey, we, we were looking at safety perceptions, experience with the SRL mental health clinician, as well as a relationship with the SRL mental health clinician. We had 369 surveys. The survey's not closed, so we continue to accept surveys from our students so that we can continue to get more and, and look at this as well as the end of the year again. Uh, parent survey, we had 444 total surveys. Uh, we looked at uh, safety perceptions and importance of the SRO mental health clinician team. Uh, for staff, we had 141 total surveys uh, looking at the perceptions around safety, the relationship with the SRO mental health clinician, as well as the importance of the SRO mental health clinician on that campus. And then finally, with the focus groups, we're looking at the three, again, from the first one, safety perceptions, experiences with the SRO mental health clinician, and the relationship that they had with the SRO mental health clinician. Uh, looking at the first um, survey for our students, we asked uh, first question whether our students uh, that were surveyed or responded to a survey ever had contact with the SRO mental health clinician. And so 84.7% indicated that they have not had an interaction with the um, SRO mental health clinician, and only 15.3% um, did indicate some contact with the SRO mental health clinician. Um, I look at this as a good thing because we were surveying already those that had interactions with the um, you know, with the SRO mental health clinician, so we're also looking at those that have not to encapsulate both populations that are are in our student representation as well. So, in terms of whether the perception of the SRO making their their them f um, making their school feel safer, uh, we had 37.7 percent of our responses indicated that yes, they agree with the statement uh, that they made them feel safer, while only 5.2 percent disagreed. When we looked at um, whether they were distracted from their schoolwork because there was a presence of a mental condition SRL team at their uh, campus, 68.8% disagree that the SRL mental health condition team was a distraction to them, and 3.9% agree that their team was a distraction to them at school. When we're looking at the relationship and whether they feel comfortable speaking to or um, with the presence of the mental health clinician, 49.3% um, uh, indicated that they feel comfortable with the presence and 3.8% indicated not feeling comfortable. In terms of um, reaching out to the mental health clinician and the SRO about safety uh, concerns involving uh, themselves at, and all their friends, 38.1% uh, felt or responded that they do feel comfortable talking to the SRO mental health clinician about their safety concerns, and 12.7% indicated not feeling comfortable uh, speaking to the SRO mental health clinician about their safety concerns. When we looked at um, our family surveys, um, we looked at whether they thought the relationship between uh, the SRO um, and the student was beneficial. 83% um, of our responses for families indicated that the relationship between the SRO and the students was beneficial, while only 4.4% did not believe that that relationship was positive. When we asked about their perceptions of safety in terms of whether they thought having this team at their campus made the campus safer, 82% um, agree that having the SRO mental health clinician team make the school safer, while only 4.9% disagree that having the SRO mental clinician made that uh, school safer. 
We wanted to also learn from the parents whether they felt that the SRL mental clinician pairing was an intricate part in the overall safety of the campus. 84.3% uh, believed that they were an intricate part of the school safety, and 5.1% did not believe the SRL mental health team played an intricate part in the school safety. We asked whether they felt it would be a detriment if the school and mental health, uh, the school mental health clinician and the SRL team was eliminated from the campus. 89.3% believed that it would be a detriment um, in, in believing that it, this team at their campus was important, while 3.7% did not believe it would be a detriment to school if the team was el eliminated. We asked our staff, would you describe the relationship between the school resource officer and student beneficial? 64.1% uh, of the staff who responded felt that the relationship was beneficial, while 11.5% um, indicated not believing that it was uh, beneficial. We asked as well whether their perceptions about safety, 65.6% uh, 65 per, 65 agree that having the SRL mental clinician on their campus made the school feel safer, while only 7.6% disagree that that was the case. We asked whether the, the, in terms of helping de-escalate situations on campuses and what the staff um, believe if, if they were effective or not in this process, 58.8% uh, of the responses indicated that the SRL mental health condition team was effective in de-escalating situation, while 9.2% did not believe that, that they were effective in the de-escalation process. When we asked staff if they felt that the team played an intricate part in the overall safety of the campus, a 67.4% believe that it was an um, intricate part of the school safety, while 7% believe that it, it was not an intricate part in the school safety. When we asked about whether um, they felt that it would be a detriment if the school eliminated the team um, from their site, 68.5% uh, believe that it would be a detriment um, to the school if the team was eliminated. 8.5% did not believe it would be a detriment to the school if the team was eliminated. The fun part for me was meeting with the groups out at the site because that's typically where um, I get to engage in more open-ended questions. I get to elicit more feedback from them and it just sometimes becomes a very uh, kind of fun process to really get in their thought process and figuring out what their, what their wishes are and or what their thoughts are about the team. Uh, these were some of the quotes that were recorded as part of the notes in the, in the interview process. Uh, we followed a same uh, sim uh, basic model in terms of the questionings that we were asking our students. So we asked about whether they felt that the SRL mental condition was uh, an integral part in the safety of their campus. Uh, we also asked whether they felt that they were comfortable speaking to an SRL mental condition um, about their safety concerns. Uh, there was questions around um, any incident in which they witness um, a student uh, having an interaction or not uh, with the SRL mental health condition and what, would, what did that look like for them as a just a, a bystander from the situation. Uh, there's lots of uh, positive uh, remarks from the student focus group. Um, I'll read just a couple and I'll provide some context to one of them that it, it needs context. I feel it definitely helps and I feel they're not having a negative impact. When I see an officer, I feel more protected. Makes the campus safer because if they're in an emergency, it makes their response faster. Security do a good job, but sometimes we need police. And I'll provide a little bit of a context on the one that it says, it was scary because there were so many cops. At the same time, it was reassuring that things would be handled. This was a student who, uh, from Watteville High School, who was witnessing um, an officer responding to a community incident and while she was in uh, PE. And so she recognized that she, there was an SRL on campus that could have close communication. They, they, made us, they made comments about how that communication between Watson Bleep Police department and having radios and they said they have radios right so they can easily communicate if something's happening um, there was actually an event that um, an incident that occurred near the neighborhood of Wantamo High School the day prior to me visiting for the focus group and the students actually made some positive comments of how quickly the SRO was able to you know um, provide assistance to WPD in, in addressing that so that it didn't become a bigger issue for the campus 
So in terms of our, our training and cross-site collaboration, uh, we continue to work with Deputy Lopez and Officer Johnson in our threat assessment protocols. Um, there is going to be some changes in our threat assessment protocol assessment in the future as, as laws are changing. And so they're going to be an, even more of an integral part in our threat assessment um, process. So we'll definitely continue to work with them on threat assessments. Uh, safety care training, uh, these are often uh, used as a, to intervene for de-escalations and supporting uh, students. ALICE training certification, they're becoming an integral part in, 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 our, in our trainings as well as understanding how to respond from their end and integrating them in our ALICE uh, protocols. Uh, Safe Schools Conference, so Deputy Lopez had an opportunity to attend a Safe Schools Conference last summer. Uh, we have plans to attend a Safe Schools Conference this uh, summer, hopefully, uh, with the team so that we can all learn together. Uh, team Shadow Days, these were um, super um, successful. So we had the Aptos High School SRO Mental Health Condition coming over to Watsonville High School, uh, shadowing our, our SROs there, and then learning how their, their process is at that school, and then vice versa, Watsonville High School's uh, team going over, Ab over to Aptos High School and kind of cross-sharing best practices and aligning our practices. Our site progress monitoring, um, I do meet uh, regularly with the teams uh, to just kind of figure out where, uh, how things are going. Um, we also, our, our sites presented a progress update to our school site councils this year and provided an opportunity for input through there as well. Um, and then our team collaborations that help kind of uh, review our, our, our data and, and look at our, our next steps if we, need, if we needed to adjust or make some changes. Some additional supports that our community engagement that our SROs are involved in, uh, they're, they're typically, um, since now they've become a part of the school, they're uh, providing some uh, coverage and or uh, supervision and support our athletic um, and activity events. Um, oftentimes they, the students even ask themselves uh, whether they uh, are coming to their dance and or if they're coming to their uh, games. Um, I, I'll have to share, because I did tell one of the students in my focus group that I, I would relay this message was very concerned about um, whether they would be losing the partnership that they have at Watamo High School. And I said, I reassured that I would relay that message to the community that they were very concerned about the, you know, that program being eliminated because they felt that both that team were very strong and were concerned that either one of them would not be there. Providing a safe space for students would needed. Um, if you have not gotten a chance to visit the, the space that the SRO Mental Health Condition has at Watonville High School, I highly recommend that you do so. They've, they've converted that space to be a very safe space for students. Um, you know, Maria has done an awesome job out there to create um, you know, this, this space where students are feeling comfortable going to them. Uh, support SEO learning through conferencing, connecting students to resources, and delivering SEO lesson plans in the classroom. Uh, this is what we've been talking about, making sure that they're integrated in our our processes. Uh, so at Watsonville High School, our SRO mental condition participating in our wellness teams, um, as well as supporting the site with the delivery of, of lessons in the classroom. Uh, responding, responding to after hours stop it and other uh, tools that we that we have in place to uh, support us in tracking incidents. Uh, so they're always available to support us in in responding to anonymous reports through stop it or gaggle alerts um, and any other reports that are coming through after hours as well. Uh, collaborated with school administration on comprehensive safety plan. This was huge this uh, last um, this year round. Uh, we met with with both of the SROs as, as a as a, a review of our, our safety plans. They offered great feedback to us, which uh, helped us you know adjust and make some adjustments to our comprehensive safety plan. So they become a very important a piece of of our comprehensive safety plans. And then you know they're they're members of the of the Watsonville and Aptos community, so they're always looking for volunteer opportunities mentoring students as well as just participating in any school activity that they may have. I think you saw some photos of um, uh, some of our officers participating in some of our um, ASB activities and, and just um, being a part of that. In terms of the cost, um, I, I wanted to just share um, with the board in terms of what it's the program it's costing us and, and would the implications of, of finance if, if the board approves the continuation of the pairing. Uh, our mental health condition for three mental health conditions, assuming that the, this would be at PV High School, Watsonville High School, and Apto High School would cost about 507487 
while only two mental health conditions would be a cost of 343,833. Um, I, I will share with you that we have yet not been successful at hiring our um, SRO for PB High School. We're actively working with our Watsonville Police Department to uh, support in that, um, as well as our mental health condition uh, for uh, PB High. Our school resource officer cost um, is about 526,474 for three SROs, uh, 342,474 for two SROs. And then you'll see the total cost there for uh, over 1 million for three sites and 686,307 for two sites. Some of the recommendations that um, our team has come up for uh, if the board approves the, the uh, continuation of the pairing. Uh, we do believe that it is important to continue to log the interactions uh, that our students are having with the SRL mental health clinician um, and continuing to survey those students who are actually uh, having those interactions. Um, we would also like to take a look at the, the questions that were previously developed as part of that survey, uh, maybe to um, adjust and, and make some adjustments to them, but we do feel that it is important to continue to survey uh, those students. We want to continue the cross co collaboration uh, with the team meetings, the shadow days, and then alignment of the best practices. So this year, the shadow days um, revealed uh, um, great opportunities for us to align practices between the sites. Uh, collaboration with Watsonville Police Department and our Sheriff's Department in terms of a hiring and assignment details. Uh, this year we were, uh, we did participate in the hiring of the SRO at Watsonville High School, so we're very uh, fortunate and we want to continue that with uh, Watsonville Police Department. Um, continue with the threat assessments, as I mentioned before. They've been instrumental in, in assessing our threats that have come away, whether, you know, most of them turn out to be non-credible, but still it's, it's reassuring that we do have some support support with our SROs. Um, the school comprehensive safety plan, it is an ongoing um, assessment as we experience new, new things uh, in, in our community. And so it's always helpful to consult with them and help, help us be, or have them be part of our discussion in terms of adjustments to our safety plans. And then the alignment of incident response, um, this was more in terms of uh, we the the team felt that both SROs have been have been embedded uh, long enough in our school systems to understand our our, our system in the education, and sometimes it, it became challenging when either Officer Johnson or Deputy Lopez was not on campus and having to call an officer from Watsonville Police Department. So we're wanting to collaborate with uh, the department so that they also understand um, our our SRO mental health condition programming, so that they whenever another officer that is not embedded. In our school can also have the same level of response as they do or knowledge and notion of the program. Uh, incorporating our SRO, uh, SRO mental condition team in our MTSS process, so there's lots of teams that are happening to help already identify students, whether it's the PBIS team or the wellness team, so um, recommendations for incorporating them in that um, regard. Uh, document process and procedures for the mental health and SRO program. This year we took a lot of just time to assess our, our programming, align our practices, uh, but felt shy on documentation. So we have some fundamental documents that provide some guidance, but we definitely want to make it more robust. Um, I do want to commend our district. I, I typically, as a director of student services, get requests from other districts of information of our SRO mental health condition, because we are one, Yes, that uh, is the first that has this, this pairing. And so typically uh, when I, I get requests from other districts and other uh, directors, I, this is where I think we can provide some additional guidance and share the wealth that, that we do have. And with that, I, I leave it up to questions and also um, I would like to request that we uh, approve the continuation of the SRO Mental Health Clinician Program. Thank you, Dr. Garaz. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. We have 10, and I will call again up by three. And again, if I do pronounce your name incorrectly, please correct me. Uh, Chris Webb, Pam Sexton, and Bobby Marshall. Marshall Salt. Thank you. And each speaker, again, gets uh, two minutes. Good evening, I would request we not squander uh, scarce education dollars on uh, what could be a free service. Um, also, part of the problem here is I'm not, I've seen from some of the meetings related to this, 
uh, consistent lack of any transparency on use of force data. Also, I'm not hearing anything about protections of teachers who might have to intervene if we have some kind of situation where an SRO is violating student rights. And I don't bring that up lightly. If you've been paying attention to the news, you know that there's been some major incidences in our country and the people who are surrounding um, cops acting badly are being brought up on charges. So I wanna know how, how you're gonna protect teachers. I also don't bring that up lightly because a Renaissance student from Watsonville reported to, to my class at one time that, saying that she or th they watched the fight, another kid who wasn't a part of the fight got dragged by the SRO by their hoodie. And I didn't hear that the mental health clinician stopped this or anything. I'm wondering if a teacher ha had intervened, would, would they get you know, brought up on some kind of charges? Is the district gonna protect them? So those are the, and I actually had the opportunity to go to Watsonville High and verify later about that story because I, I was subbing at Watsonville High. I also had the opportunity to ask, uh, do a little survey myself, and of the students in the two sections that I sub for, uh, only 20% wanted to keep the, the SRO, 40% were neutral, 30% did not want to keep the SRO, 10% declined to say. Of the people who didn't want to keep the SRO, the number one reason was they had no relationship with the SRO, um, and the SRO had no real impact, um, and, and they were also bringing up particularly the point that um, there were, there, I saw a bathroom closed um, due to vandalism, so the, the prevention argument didn't really carry a lot of weight with me. Also, when I see, um, you know, mostly Latino kids, mostly special, special ed kids getting Thank you, interactions, doesn't seem too novel to me. Thank you. Hi, um, Pam Sexton, and here I'm. I'm also coming to you to um, urge you not to continue. And I understand that um, what you've just seen points to continuing, but I I really need to ask you to look critically at at this or this data, um, which is questionable. Um, the so I've also been at Watsonville High um, many times in the last, since the May decision. And in the conversations I've had with students, it is not 100% positive comments as was given from the focus groups. I'm not sure how the focus group makeup was decided or how the surveys were distributed, but I, from my personal experience, I can't, I can't jive with what I just saw. Um, but beyond that, we need to think about what our uh, funding strapped school district, how we can spend our money the most effectively. And, and when we do look at data on that, it is in supporting the, having full staffing, having enough social emotional counselors that one doesn't have hundreds that they're they're having to serve, and we can we can use this money more. One thing that teachers, um, parents, and students that I've talked to have said is um, having school um, su campus supervisors. Campus supervisors have been there a long time, and. And there, there's that developed relationship. Now there is a, a relationship developing, and this is not against the individual SROs who are there. This is about normalizing having armed police in our educational facilities. Watsonville High parent. I was on the SRO committee last year, uh, also a former member of the Watsonville Policing Committee, and I knew when I joined I needed to be open and even willing to change my mind. I am pretty disenfranchised in feeling that that was a one-sided endeavor. We discussed the importance of a survey back then of the wider school community, decided there wasn't enough time, but as approached, the board wanted it, so it went forth without our input. After the fact, we voiced several concerns. Uh, the data should be separated out by schools. It wasn't. 
Uh, we should know, we should ask about the SRO and mental health clinicians separately. You still didn't. Last year, quote from my student, are you comfortable talking to the team? How do I answer that? They're two different people and one has a gun. I never saw the email, by the way. I didn't get to take that because it came from the principal. Uh, simply just said, uh, let's see, no context. Just said, we want to hear from you. Here's a survey. Didn't even know what it was. I heard of uh, one class where the students began to talk about it when they received it because they just learned about uh, surveys and polls and they discovered that it did not meet any of the requirements uh, to be a scientific uh, or reliable study. So it was a teaching tool. Focus groups, not a single student with a negative opinion. That is not representative from my experience. What atmosphere was created even to make it safe for dissenting opinions to be expressed? It really feels to me like there is zero interest from this district in hearing anything aside from what we want to hear to maintain the status quo. Did you ever reach out to Milpa or Barrios Unidos or anybody to hear a perspective uh, from those who are advocating for formerly incarcerated youth? We haven't seen evidence that an SRO on campus has been effective in stopping school shootings and another gun and criminalizing students is not the answer. At the very least, please show that you want to hear another perspective rather than cherry picking data that reinforces the one we have. Our perceived safety is not worth the cost of a positive learning environment for vulnerable and marginalized students on campus. Also, there were raises not approved last meeting out of concern for the budget, and it seems like this is far more money than those, and at least those were directed at directly education. I have other thoughts, uh, well, I'll keep going because I got a couple of or seconds. You know, if there's an officer, officer, let's reimagine not having a gun. Um, I got other thoughts, I'll email you. Thank you. Our next three, Roddy Kirkman, Providence Martinez, and Martha Vega. Good evening again. Um, I want to speak to specifically the budget aspect of this item um, on the agenda, mostly because I'm the chief negotiator for PVFT and we are in contract negotiations. Um, police account for 40% of the Watsonville city budget. We are a public school district. So why are we contributing to an already inflated budget? The Watsonville Police Department can supply that out of their own funding. We are always talking about what we cannot afford in this district. What are the more important things that we need to spend that money on? The cost of three SROs would actually fund a two student reduction from 34 students to 32, which is what we've been advocating for in fourth through sixth grades. Just wanted to point that out. Is Providence in the room? I'll set it aside. Maybe she stepped out for a minute. Sorry, some Miss Vega, if you'll come on up. Thank you. My name is Martha Vega, and all the voices that are being heard are, are valid. Budget is one of them. It would be great to be able to see the document of the budget so everyone could see the budget. Um, so there's clarity. Um, for all <sighs> classified staff right we, we in order for everything to function uh, there's various fa facets so we could see success a working building a principal a vice principal staff custodian cafeteria staff repairs to be made social and emotional counselor guidance counselors um, campus security mental health it's also vital to have programs for success for our students, such as music programs, sports, um, and as well as credit recovery, study halls. Um, it provides all that, but I don't want it for us to be divided. I'm in support of all that. I transition leaving the city. Um, I used to work at the courthouse. I used to work at the district, attorney, district attorney's office. I used to respond um, going to autopsies and processing crime scenes. I did a career change and I'm a teacher. I live here, work here, and I am in support of the SRO and the mental health. So I don't want us to be divided. Thank you so much for the report. I hope you're in favor, 
but we need to be in favor of supporting all. Um, you know, for individuals to be earning $19, it's not enough, um, which without having to indicate who they are. So um, various facets need to be in play. And growing up here, I used to be involved. I used to play the saxophone. Um, um, I, I just, I want us to be um, one community with various things in play so we could be successful. And thank you. Our next three, Donna Lefevre, Karina Moreno, and Bernie Gomez. Hello again, Donna Lefevre. I'm a teacher at Watsonville High School. Um, I just want to uh, first point out um, the questions in the survey. I just finished a unit with my math students um, earlier this semester about bias and statistical questions, and the questions were extremely biased. Um, so just to point out, do you feel that the SRM mental health clinician contribute to safety, or do you feel that it would be a detriment if they left? I mean, yeah, we want more adults on campus, and we want, if we took them away, that would be a detriment to safety, sure. What if the question instead said, how should the district prioritize funding to ensure safety at our site? And then we could maybe have a better picture of would we fund mental health support or would we fund having a police officer on campus? So th that question already, you should be really concerned at the data that we're seeing in that whole presentation. Um, Second, I recently had an incident that occurred in my class where I had to step outside. I normally handle everything in my class, but there was something that came up I had to reach out. Um, unfortunately, uh, when I was needing support, over several days, the mental health staff at our site were not there for, for a variety of reasons. Um, so the SRO was not paired with a mental health clinician, and so there weren't um, those supports brought in to the incident. The students came right back into my class without having interacted with any kind of mental health support. Um, I had to push for it actively all the time and barely. I was just, I was so horrified at the lack of restorative practices that are implemented at our site. And then to see that um, most of the referrals are happening with grade nine and grade 10, and it's on preventative measures. I mean, if you had smaller class sizes or you had instructional assistants pushing into the classes to support those kids, the needs of those kids, and building those relationships, which we know is key to to help support the well-being, the safety, and the really um, the learning community of our school. Like we need those relationships, and so if we invest our funding into the teachers and making sure we have people in class supporting those kids, then that's going to be how we keep our school safe. Hi, buenas tardes. My name is Karina Moreno. Um, and I also really thought that this, this data and this presentation was irresponsible for its lack of transparency, but also because of its bias, right? You had ninth, gra ninth and 10th graders being referred at the highest rates. You know, youth who are at, at this age going through new stages of development, also coming out of COVID and a lot of stressors, right? And at that age, your brain, your prefrontal cortex, the science proves, hasn't been developed. And so your judgment, your problem solving, and your emotional processing also isn't developed. And this coincides also with the data that the top three reasons that students were referred was for peer conflict, being a potential victim, and social anxiety. And I thought it was irresponsible to, to not highlight that, that at Watsonville High School, 32 youth were, were referred for mental health concerns. Um, almost triple those other top three reasons that were listed. Um, but this also coincides, right, with, with, with what happened last year. It was students with these issues being referred and also students with disabilities and special needs. Last year it was nine students. This year it's four times that, just at Watson High School alone. And that, that scares me, right, because it's, it's everything that we've, we see data, right, that, that SROs, are targeting students of color or, or people of color, people with disabilities and LGBTQ students, and yet none of that makeup was identified in the students, but you had 84.6% of students that didn't even have an interaction with the SROs and whose makeup we don't know talking about how they're comfortable 
with SROs on campus and, and mental health clinicians. And then you have a one-to-one -one ratio at Aptos High School of Hispanic to, to white students, but you have double the Hispanic students being referred to these SROs and mental health clinicians. And so, I mean, yeah, if we can, if we can support, you know, mental health and also the additional supports, I think that's worth the money. Thank you. Uh, good evening, um, boards. Um, I just want to thank the prior speakers for articulating that, right? Because I was thinking, uh, I was thinking, man, how can I articulate or go or just kind of try to challenge something, right? When a picture was painted so fine, you know, that everything's okay. Um, but you heard that, so what I'm going to say is what I heard in the beginning. I heard um, a Renaissance student coming up here asking for a soccer field so they can play soccer. So they can play. I seen a video of Aptos with golf, soccer, all the type of sports, right? You know, a good, a well-placed high school, you know, um, understanding Renaissance is a continuation. I came from Renaissance, from new school, right? And I understand the, uh, <clears throat> the need for services, supports, right, for safety. Um, but I think when we, when we think about safety is having uh, well-resourced um, schools, well-funded teachers, right? Happy teachers, happy students, you know? Of course, we don't have no control over the, um, the lateral violence that might happen at school, right? Um, we don't have control of people's emotions, you know, things like that, you know, but I think that if we create a culture in schools where um, you have smaller class, uh, sm smaller class sizes, uh, just different services in the schools, community involvement, right? Um, also the mental health, the counselors, just a wraparound type of approach, you know, that I think every, that's, it's just better for everybody. But right now we're just focusing on two just on mental health and the SRO, right? Um, and it's just, it's not cost effective. You know, you're, you're, you're going to, uh, you know, the teachers are asking for raising all, the, all that stuff, you know, so I just think, Thank you. you know, there's a, a better approach, you know, so no on SROs and keep the uh, mental health. And, um, Susan Cohen, and I'll make another call for Providence Martinez, if she's still here. Hello, is this working? Hi, um, so I also want to um, that I um, am not for the uh, SRO being in the school. And I, everybody, again, spoke so well and, and said so many things, and I just want to be another voice that is saying I have concerns that, um, that we're not um, really analyzing what is safety, what, what keeps our kids safe, what do they really want. And what do the teacher, I mean, we're really clear hearing what the teachers need. And I have been a teacher and um, hope to be subbing actually in PVSD soon. And, um, and you know, what we, I know from my past teaching that spending time with the kids talking about issues in the classroom, not that I have to be a therapist, but just making space in the classroom. But there can't be, like, if you're going from 34 to 32 kids, and that's a stretch, 32 is still a huge class size. Um, I, I, I can't believe that that is even a fight. I have notes, but my phone's going to die. Um, we all know, you all know all the research, I'm just going to repeat things, that shows that armed police officers on campus, who that impacts disproportionately, negatively affects students of color, students with learning disabilities, and LGBTQ students. This report shows this. Um, 
I'm also so concerned about how just this glorification of having like the relationships and how the relationships with WPD and the relationships of having, again, not, not the individual SROs, and I'm sure they're wonderful, but people, but just having this like glorification of a militarization of police in general and having them on our campuses and, okay. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have any discussion from the board? Mr. Dice Jr. I would just like to say thank you, Mr. Alacras, for the research that you've done. Um, as everybody knows, I have a bunch of little eyes and little ears on Watson behind. They see when you're there and they know how proactive you are when, when meeting each other. Um, I 110% support the SRO and the mental health clinician that are there. They're born and raised. They know the pulse of our community. Um, I'm able to talk to them whenever I can. But I also like to play a clip that recently came out. Well, it came out last year, uh, an incident that happened at close to Watsonville High School. And if, if we could play that for a couple of minutes. One one Watsonville and one three to cover. The subject with a gun, negative four seventeen on Riverside Break. One one. One twenty one Riverside two one Riverside off of March and Union. We're still landline with a Spanish speaker. Uh, the about a minute ago, RP saw somebody with a gun in the apartment complex. We're still getting further right now. Coming. Was there another unit with traffic? Was the black beanie, dark blue jeans, and the gun was probably a 45. Copy that. And our most recent update is the RP said um, if an officer approaches from Riverside, and then another from another one from the alley, we would probably be able to find him. You're going down the right one. One two. The one one. What was the description one more time? Uh, looks like it's an unknown race male wearing a black sweater, black beanie, dark jeans, and um, he's coming back and forth from the park in the complex. We got one running uh, towards the high school. Can you lock down the high school? There's actually three running. Be one running towards the high school and a lock down the high school. The high school! Reach it in the place there! Running towards the window there! Blue jeans! Puppy jacket! Black hair! White emblem! I got another set! Take it up on March and George Beach! Copy. Blue jeans, puppy jacket, running towards the high school, another one on March in. Another you got there! Towards the Riverside! Back towards Riverside! Copy another towards Riverside. Near Bobcats! He's near Brown Bobcats! <laughs> Copy, running down Bakke. Towards Marchant. We got one detained and, uh, tracked him. Copy, one detained. Spread a Bakke. I need somebody to continue on Marchant towards Beach. The third subject. Copy, you got him in front of. Same one, Marchant to Beach. Same one, copy. And you got him in front of 240 Bakke. Say five one at uh, March and uh, Maple. I'm code four. George M six copy. March and Maple, and your code four. I have all three. Uh, George one one six. You have one, and George one ten. You have the other. We have one all black with a uh, yeah all black. What's we'll with George one one six? I got one for the two forty buckets. George 110 has another one. George M6 has a third. We have three. We got all of them detained. Top. Running towards Watsonville High School on Bacchius. Suspects caught on Bacchius. Bacchius is not even a block away from Watsonville High School. A call had to be made to an SRO to lock down Watsonville High School. And... I support this program. Thank you. Trustee Scal.
Thank you. Piece of chocolate. Keep me going. Uh, thank you for all the, the public comment. Thank you for the presentation. Um, this is a issue that stirs up a lot of emotions and feelings. Um, I've had my own views on this over the years. I've had family, many of whom are teachers, but some who are in law enforcement as well. And I think they did a very good job serving their community. Um, I've heard a lot of feedback from my area and the good folks at Pajaro Valley High School who are upset that they haven't gotten an SRO yet and are concerned about that. And really liked um, the officer, I think CJ was there before, and they really had some positive uh, re relationships with him. And, and it does take a community. It's not, I don't believe that one officer alone is the superhero and that, that, that th those comments are on, are, are on correct. When you go to PV High, you'll, you'll find the, the classified staff, counselors, the principal, everybody's out there creating a very positive vibe. And that's, and that's very important to building the culture of safety. Um, but I've heard from a lot of them that they do want an SRO. Um, I want to say something else about special ed and for those who are concerned about the school to prison pipeline. The school to prison pipeline, a lot of the data shows around the country that it originates in problems with special education. And we have problems with our special education program in this district, if we're just going to be honest about it. And that's why we need more resources. We need to have the prep time honored. We need to have the classified staff there. If we want to think about prevention, we need to make sure our kids are getting the services they need from early on. And so that's how everything's connected. And I know some of you see the connections, and I feel your frustration because you're like, well, look, you guys are going to want to fund this, but we're not adequately funding that. And you're right. I, but I reject that th everything's an either-or proposition. And in my previous comments, with whether it's administration, t I, I reject either or propositions. I know things get framed that way, that way. But if we're going to be a successful district, we have to find a way. This is the business of the district to fund the people who are serving our kids at all levels. Um, I do want to say that, and this is the last thing, but it's important. I feel our community, I've had a lot of conversations with people about Watsonville PD. And I, and I got to say, most of them, people respect Watsonville PD. They feel they're local people who serve us, treat us fairly well relative to other co other police stories that we hear. And I've also heard negative stories as well, as, as you would expect in any other community. I do think there is something to fairness going forward about how we pay for this program should we vote to continue it. Because our community has voted to fund Watsonville PD. Some of you feel at a too high of a rate. Some, some people feel at just the right amount. Our community also votes to fund the sheriff, the Santa Cruz County Sheriff. Um, and we, I think there is something to knowing that we're in the, primarily in the business of providing good education and everything that comes, goes with that. So I just wonder, in, uh, in moving this forward, can we find a way to negotiate fairly? I know our board and our leadership has great relationships with the Watsonville City Council, the mayor, um, and with the county leaders. Um, I would like to support this, but I would like to support it understanding that we can work with them to negotiate in good faith to find a way to pay for this in a way. I'm not saying it's 50-50 necessarily, but that it would be nice if they could cover it because the people who are funding those, it's all the same people, right? It's the public. The public is PVUSD. The public is Watsonville. The public is Santa Cruz County. So if those people are already funding those departments, and we have 4,000 kids in Watsonville at both Pajaro Valley High School and Watsonville High School every day, certainly it's the purview of the police department to to protect, or should be already in the, in the mission to help provide the coverage. We're asking for a little more with the ESR, I understand that. So there's a fairness thing, but I, I would um, like to support that if we continue this, could we, could we negotiate something, a little, some kind of cost sharing agreement with these agencies in good faith? And I understand we can't do that right now, but I would like to, I would be supportive of, of a motion that could include that type of language, and also reviewing it with the public. There should be account accountability, uh, law enforcement, our public servants as well. They also, accountability, we need to have a feedback mechanism within our district that include, to include people on campus to ensure that the SROs are, are, um, 
are, 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 are truly being productive and helping. And I, and I believe they are for the most part, but there's always going to be, there's, there's always a, more feedback is a good thing. So if we can kind of institute some kind of feedback mechanism, maybe it will exist, but I'm not sure if it does beyond the survey, but actually have a committee where we are getting back from the, the board is hearing ongoing and, and yearly about how, how it's going, I think that would be helpful as well. Thank you. Chris, did you want to clarify on that? So um, last year, the board made that re that request. So we we did engage in conversations. Doesn't mean that we can't re-engage in conversations. Um, I did just want to make a point. If this was approved tonight, we are planning on going after the Department of Just Justice grant, um, which would pay um, one hundred and twenty-five thousand per each one of the pairings. Um, and so we have not gone after that grant at this point, um, but we would do so upon the approval of the board. Um, and that would help support a portion of that cost. Any other questions or comments? Just what, but before I want to, I have a, a trustee for us. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone who did come forward and speak. Um, we definitely, I definitely am hearing your concerns, and um, I also, I, I'd like to echo what, um, what. Um, sorry, Trustee Scott also said, as far as it, you know, it doesn't have to be just because we would fund this, we're not wanting to fund um, anything else. I firmly agree that class sizes is, is something we need to address. Um, I feel like it's, there, there's a lot we need to address. Um, we are going to, you know, if I, I would like to, you know, take it one step at a time. Um, right now, you know, our focus, my focus at least, well, our, our teacher crisis is one, but also, you know, when I was running for this position, safety was a huge concern of mine. Um, as a parent and speaking to other parents, it's a huge concern for a lot of parents. And so I feel like, you know, we definitely have to make sure our children are protected. Um, I grew up on Bacchus, um, so to hear that was a little frightening. I brought back some memories. I. I Saw some some things when I lived there. My father grew up on Bacchus. We call ourselves Bacchus Bruisers. It's a big community, um, but it's it's. I feel that um, the program that we've created is very unique, and I feel like it's working. I've talked to several students at Watsonville High School, particularly, that said that they do, in fact, feel better knowing that there is an officer there, and they do have a good relationship with his that officer. I had a great relationship with the SRO that was on campus when I was at Watsonville High School. Um, I also, like Trustee Scow, have had several people from Pajaro Valley High School ask, you know, why are why were we left out? You know, we we would like to have this as well. So. I just want to say that I did definitely listen and hear all the comments tonight, but I will be um, voting in support of this. Dr. Alcaraz, I had a, a couple of clarifying questions. One, I, thank you for addressing about the um, admin referrals and the higher percentage. I just wanted to know if, if, if you could just expand on that a little further on you know admin being a, a, a first line, because I'm not sure members of the public might understand that. Like, why might when we see a referral coming from admin, like why might it come from admin versus, you know, like a higher percentage from admin? Like why would they be the first line? Can you right. expand on that a little so bit? So we have several mechanisms in place to um, report things. So whether it's stop it, whether they're using their Chromebook uh, to search something of that nature, those alerts typically go to administration. And so uh, typically we then respond to those alerts um, and we are the first ones in terms of administration to get those. And I, as a director of student services also get, in fact, like I get one every five minutes and we have to you know, assess the seriousness of those reports. And so that's typically a lot of the reports are coming through our anonymous uh, reporting mechanisms as well through our gaggle uh, tools that monitor their, um, we also get some through some to grow which is our other uh, programming that alerts us to any specific issues that may be coming up on campus, whether it's a peer conflict that somebody's reporting on Stop It, 
whether, whether it's a, a suicide risk assessment that falls through a note that they wrote on their computer while they're, you know, at school and Gag will pick that up. Um, so those are the kinds of things that are coming through a lot of our report, uh, our monitoring tools. And we, uh, administration is the first one to respond to that. And, and just to, you know, on slides 9 and 10, kind of with our special education you know, students, you know, you, with getting that data broken down further, you know, and to the types of referrals that they're getting, you know, um, because of those percentages, you know, we're seeing that difference at Aptos High and the difference, you know, at, at Watsonville High. But then also seeing that difference, you know, at Aptos High where, you know, we were seeing like 41 Point eight percent, you know, were getting covered by the mental health clinician, whereas, you know, it there was that higher percentage there. You know, is there are those two data points linked? Is that a linked correlation? You know, because you were talking about it being, you know, preventative versus response, but are we seeing, you know, with that higher percentage of our special ed students, are we seeing it, you know, more special ed referrals? on our, the mental health side or, you know, is it SRO side, you know, where's, where's that? Yeah. So the, the team has the ability to sort the data many ways. Right. And so we typically do when we see something of that nature. Uh, so we do, we did take a look at where are those referrals essentially coming from? What are the, the referral reasons and then who's addressing that referral? And so to your, uh, to your point, uh, many of the, ref uh, the referrals with both of these groups are being addressed solely by the mental health clinician and or with the collaboration of the SRO. But n I think I, I saw one that was just strictly from the SRO, which is what we typically don't want to see. So there wasn't like a huge alert on our end when we review that data and sorted in that regard as something concerning that the SRO was the only person assisting uh, this this. this events or, or referrals that were coming in. Okay. And then on um, like slides, I think, uh, was it 11 and 12 about, you know, the ethnicity data? You know, so with Watsonville's referrals being relatively proportional and, you know, Aptos High is not, to what are you attributing that difference? Yeah, so the, the Aptos High School team um, does have a, a data team that's looking at some of these. So Katie, Chris Kunis, who is the assistant principal there, is working with some of their uh, teachers as well as their support staff uh, to, there's lots of theories of why this could possibly uh, come about. What our concern as a team is, again, what are the referrals? Who's making contact and what is the outcome, right? So the I know that there's you know major concerns in previously about the school to prison nexus, right? And so we did add this pairing with the mental health condition to circumvent that. And so part of this process in looking and digesting the data is to ensure that is not the SRO who's you know addressing these um, referrals, that, that in fact is our mental health condition first. And if the mental health condition believes that there is a violation of education code or a penal code, that that's when the collaboration happens with the SRO to address that 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 matter. And and where. What happened with the SRO committee? Like, where did that? Yeah, so there was no recommendation on the board approval on May 11 to continue a committee, or um, it was just to continue the progress monitoring. So there is a team that meet internally. Um, and then the feedback and input comes from the surveys for all three entities plus the focus group. Uh, in addition to that, the, this year we did present back to school site council as another avenue for input, as well as sharing uh, progress and updates on our SRO mental clinician program. Vice President Acosta. Hello, thank you for your um, presentation. And um, I, I do also think that it's quite fitting that um, this seems to now be following under the care of you in your department. Um, it was formerly a cabinet member, but I think it is most fitting that it's falling under you and your department now. Um, so I would give kudos to that. Um, and I and there's a lot said by my other colleagues here that I um, I can definitely echo and agree with. Um, I I do have a question, and I think that this but it's going to be before you were here, so I think I'll direct it to Dr. Rodriguez see if you might be able to answer it. 
I, I remember before the SROs were removed, right, um, that we it had been discussed about um, in our budget, the line item in our budget for SROs, about the cost associated with the SROs. And I, I don't off the top of my head remember what that number was, but it, it was much lower than this now. So what happened? So I think two things. One, prior we didn't have the pairing so we did select to do the pairing. Um, so when we were going through COVID, there was, as, sh as I should have been, there was a lot of significant concern about the social emotional needs of our students. So during the times of COVID, we actually decided to take the money um, because at that point we didn't have all the one-time monies that we currently have, but um, we decided to take that money and not use it on an SRO um, and use it instead on a mental health clinician. Um, after we returned back to in-person, there was a decision to bring back that, but we really wanted to, and I was the one that presented much of the the data on it um, or much of the research on it. I mean, there is significant research about disproportionality of impact. And so we decided that we a kind of why do we have to have an either or proposition. And so we decided on this pairing. So it is fairly unique. People have followed suit with us, but we've um, we were the first that I'm aware of of actually doing this pairing. Um, so one of the reasons why it's so much more is that there is now the pairing that wasn't. So you used to have six, uh, three people, now you would have six people, right, because of the pairing. And then also costs have just continued to increase. So just as our costs have continued to increase, meaning with salary increases, then the costs increase, those cost increases are increasing for law enforcement as well. Um, and so that would be the reason for the increase um, and so I wouldn't, there's no other reason other than those two factors that I can think of. Well, yeah, and I, and I appreciate the way you all broke this out so we could see the cost for the mental health clinician and the cost for the school resource officer. And I'm just, just looking at that one cost because, mm -hmm. right, we, we didn't have the pairing. But the school resource officer cost does seem like it went up from what I recall it was in our budget line item from before. Again, I don't remember. I'm not going to quote a number because I don't remember that number specifically. But just looking at that cost, I'm saying, yeah, I'm if I didn't look at the mental health clinician, it, that that seems like it's just gone up. So I, but that there's also a lot of logic behind what you just said, also about cost of salaries and things that have gone up. Um, so I appreciate it, and also th thank you for telling and informing us that if this is approved tonight, that um, about the um, grant. Yeah. I think that's and that's we will definitely our grant writer will go after it in in conjunction with um, Dakaracas. Yes, I think that's great, um, and I, you know, and I again in agreeing with um, I, I agree with um, the the point that Trustee um, Scow Milanos brought up about maybe having a conversation <clears throat> with these other agencies about some, just at least having a conversation about what we could do with potentially a shared cost. And um, I think maybe a good place to start to possibly bring that up might be um, in the intergovernmental committee, since we are meeting with city officials, city staff, and county officials are requested to be there with, with their staff, that that might be a good place for us to start that conversation there. Um, so if, if when you're asked what to put on the agenda next time, maybe if we could get that on there, that would be great, I think. Yeah, I agree. And the only thing I'd recommend is, and I'm sure they'll ask them, is it would just be to have um, Jorge Zamora there if we're making those conversations so that the chief is able to provide input as well. Yes, and, and probably Sheriff Hart and also, if we could get our <laughs> county <laughs> elected right. leaders there as well. Yeah. Thank you exactly. for the elaboration. I'm just going to interrupt the discussion for one moment to make a procedural motion to extend the meeting till 1. 1 a.m. Is that what you said? Uh, you Sorry. know what? <laughs> it's it's 10.15 and we're on action item number one. Okay. I'll second. <laughs> uh, first and a second. All those in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries uh, 601. Um, okay, so. Um, so we've oh. got that. Do I have, um, so uh, Trustee DeSerpa, did you? I was just going to say, so again, thank you. Um, I just wanted to end it with a thank you. Um, so most of you out there might know I'm a mental health professional. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, I work now in a hospital but um, as a manager, but in my career I worked at Child Welfare, otherwise known as CPS, um, in this county and others. And um, I have had the sad job of conducting investigations, including sexual abuse investigations alongside law enforcement. So just so you know, that's where I come from. I have a very healthy respect for law enforcement colleagues because with them I have seen and experienced the worst of humanity, the harming of young children and youth. Although I am aware of the harm, the historical harm of law enforcement and the harm that sometimes happens today in our countries with our country's citizens, um, Jen Holm and I participated, and maybe some others of you participated um, in a training uh, probably two years ago or a year ago with um, our state superintendent, Tony Thurman, where they laid out a, a very compelling um, call for the harm, the harm that has been done in our schools um, as, a, as a result of policing. We listened to that, and I think we were very moved by that presentation. So I, I'm, I sit in an interesting spot because at, on one hand, I have a respect for law enforcement. On the other hand, I, I know the harm that it, that it can cause. And that's why I think as a country, we've called for reform. And in this community, we've called for reform. And in building the program where we're pairing a mental licensed mental health professional alongside of a police officer or a sheriff's deputy, um, we're trying to make reforms so that that service can be helpful so that we can intervene on things before violence happens, before kids take their own lives, that we can get kids the help that they need. Um, after the, one of the horrible things that's happened at Aptos High, the stabbing where the child lost his life, a young man lost his life, um, I spoke to principals in our three comprehensive high schools and assistant principals all together. And I asked um, what they thought of having an SRO back on campus. And um, in every instance, they're in favor of having an SRO on campus and welcomed a mental health professional um, to that dyad. Um, I also have the very unpleasant chore of, and job of serving on the Child Death Review Committee I don't know if you guys know that this, these are committees that every county has to have where we review every single death of young people under the age of 21 to try to find out if there was anything that we could have done to prevent those deaths. And that is infants, uh, neonates, all the way up um, through young people. And oftentimes we have findings or conclusions about what could have been done to prevent those deaths. I um, sat on the board the year that three students um, took their lives uh, through suicide at Aptos High, and I think often, could we have done anything to intervene on those kids? Because we did not have a lot of mental health um, professionals in our schools at that time because our budgets could not afford those. I think about the young man who lost his life uh, at the stabbing. And then in the community in Aptos, a youth was beat up with pipes. I mean, there's just one thing after another that I think about, like what could we have done to intervene earlier? So having said everything I think that, um, that I just said, um, I'm in support of having um, a pairing. I know it's very expensive. We, um, Sheriff Hart, in one of his statements on camera, told us that his budget, he has a giant budget, it's not a problem. Um, if you know, he would potentially pay for, for this position. And then we, I know we've asked him more than once. I've asked the superintendent to go back to him again and again to ask him to put his money where his mouth is. And he has not offered a cent to help pay for this. 
uh, program. Um, so I'm really happy to hear we'll go after some grants and, um, and hopefully we are a deserving community and hopefully um, we'll get money to help pay for this very important program. So I'm in full support tonight. Thank you. Trustee Dodge Jr. I just wanted to ask if instead of making this a yearly thing, we can make it every two years. Trustee Scow. Um, procedurally, new, do I, can I actually make some comments and also respond to him, or do I need to respond to that first and then ask you for permission to make some comments? Your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Learning this, this stick. Um, I, I'm in favor. I would like to make a mo motion that we continue the pairing, but without making a financial commitment just yet, because I believe that our board trustees and our superintendent I called the mayor today at the Wattsville Montesino. I said, you know, the, the people of Wattsville voted overwhelmingly to support Wattsville PD a couple of years ago. It's only fair. Can we talk about cost sharing in a fair way? I don't know what a breakdown is, and maybe it's unfeasible, but I think it's worth trying. We, it's worth trying that our school board work with our city. It's worth trying that our school board work with the sheriff. Um, and every governmental agency says, we don't have any money. That's... All right, we know it. we all say that. Every agency says that we need it, we need you to pay us entire. But I think there is a fairness thing there where our community, our public, they, we are supporting the sheriff and Wattsville PD. And if the mayor and I think other council members we have good relationships with, if we can have constructive conversations about exploring cost sharing. So I guess I would like to make them, I would, I don't know about two, I'm, I don't know about two years at this point. But maybe if, if we can have, if we could explore cost sharing first, that would make me more comfortable. Dr. Rodriguez, did you want to speak to that? So um, I want us to caution of not having a Brown Act violation by doing some of the things that you're suggesting um, due to just having serial meetings. Um, if you do that. So staff, that is the job of staff um, to have those conversations. And so if you do so, you need to tread very lightly because you will be creating a serial meeting by doing exactly what you're talking about and then voting on it. Um, so um, you just need to be cautious and use staff to have those conversations and trust staff to do the work um, because there is a reason why you can't have quorum discuss um, action items um, even if it's individuals that wind up having those conversations if you create a nexus um, then and a hub then you will wind up having a brown act violation which we would learn if we um, if we wind up having the um, the special board study session I appreciate that but I don't think I did that I don't think I violated the brown act by calling the mayor I'm not informing you that you did a brand after relation. I'm saying if you have the conversations that you're referring to and each board member has conversations um, with individual counsel, then you do have the, the opportunity to have a Brown Act violation. You, of course, as an individual talking to one person, not, but suggesting that other board members have conversations, okay. nice. you, you do yeah. have the opportunity to create a Brown Act violation. Point taken. I, yeah, so I think that um, this comes back to a full circle that I, th I think it's a good, I, I think it's a good idea to have the conversation. I think a good place for that conversation to start so there is no Brown Act violation is an intergovernmental committee meeting. Um, and then that can be brought back and any of us who sit on that can speak to that in our board comments when we deliver out of committee report. Um, and also to possibly give direction for the future for this, um, if again, is it, if this is gonna be approved tonight, for that direction. I, I to Trustee Dodge Jr.'s point, I think that um, in, unless there's some significant um, change with the cost and a cost sharing agreed upon potentially 
between the district and the city and the district and the county. Um, I, I think that bringing this back in the future as a report and discussion item, but not necessarily needing to be an action item, is a place for it, right? Really, and we have that a lot. When things we approve and we ask for reports and discussions to come back, we're not necessarily having to vote on it every year. I agree about that, unless there was some significant can't reason, and then any board member can request that, as well as a public member of the agenda setting committee to agendize it as an action item. To clarify, am I, because we, we, you know, Trustee Scott did make a motion, am, am I understanding that you would prefer? I'm, I'm concerned of what we will do to the, to the district administration's team to be able to move forward in um, what I, are they contracts, MOUs that we have with PD and the sheriff. If we vote on it and we vote yes, but we hold back the money and restrict it, I don't, I think then that's holding it back and not allowing it to go forward. And I'm all for going forward with the conversation. Again, I think we should start that conversation at an intergovernmental committee meeting. That's what part that meeting's there for, is to have some of these discussions. Um, and, and that's where we should, I feel we should go. I don't see how the district administration can move forward with the contracts and the MOUs with these other agencies if we hold back the money. Do you wish to amend that motion? Or um, do you well, let, let me, if I can respond and maybe clarify. I, what I'm, what my motion, my motion is to direct our administration to, with the policy of continuing the program, first of all, the SRO and the, the parent of the, of the mental health clinician, to continue the policy of that program uh, and to direct our administration to enter into contract negotiations with Watsonville uh, PD and uh, the city of Watsonville, rather, and or Watsonville PD and Santa Cruz County Sheriff, Sheriff's Office in hopes of finding some cost sharing that we haven't had in the previous contract because we do need to have a lot of things to pay for and that the administration negotiate that and bring that back to us um, next meet whenever it's feasible. Um, and if, 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 it's, if it's nothing there, I think it's worth trying. That, that's my motion. I, my, and you might disagree, but that's, that's my motion. I, I'm, I'm just not sure if I understand. So you're, you're not voting ask, in, in your motion, you're not suggesting that we hold back money. You're saying let's move forward, but also you're wanting but to direct the administration to, to, to start to negotiate the, the money. Yeah, to negotiate the money and then bring it back to us for a final, here's what the money is, here's exactly our financial commitment from PVUSD, and then we'll, we'll approve it then. I don't know if that's the point of order, a motion's on the table. If no one seconds it, it just goes away, and then someone else can make a new motion. So why don't we entertain the motion that's on I the think I, I, it was just a, trying to, to understand his motion. Yeah, yeah I get it. Yeah. I, I really Thank am. You. I appreciate that. I just, and if that motion is <laughs> to move forward and to give the district administration the ability to move forward with it as it is, but to start those conversations, I'm fine with seconding that motion if that's what the motion is. I'm just not sure I'm clear on that. I'm it's to direct the administration to enter negotiations and to try to find cost sharing, a cost sharing agreement with the two entities, the Santa Cruz County Sheriff, and if there's, and to bring back the final costs for us for approval, for the financial approval. So it's moving the policy forward without making, because otherwise what's the point of, there's no, then there's no negotiation. There's no, if we just say, here's all the money now, then there's no incentive to negotiate. Then it's like a done deal. So we're just, we're trying to save a little money, right? So that's, that's my thinking. But we, but we ha we've already done that. We've been trying to do that. And yeah. respectfully, I, I understand yeah. the intent behind the motion. I would be voting no on that, not because I, but because it's a directive for a negotiation that we've already agreed to talk about in the intergovernmental, but it, it says that we have to enter into a negotiation and bring it back, but it's like work that we're already doing. Well, we might disagree, but that's my motion. I, there's an okay. alternative proposal there, I say, I, I, but that's my motion is what it is. Okay. So was that a, an official second? 
right, so we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Okay, the motion dies for lack of a second. I'd like to make, try to make a meeting in the middle of the road on this. Um, um, I'd like to make a motion that we move forward and approve um, action item 9.1. The pairing of our mental health clinician, clinician with our school resource officer program, um, but also to um, give the district administration the direction to um, move forward with um, the city of Watsonville when creating the agenda for intergovernmental relation committee to have this be an agendized item and to have all the important people that, that would be key players in that, the chief of police, Sheriff Hart, our two county supervisors, um, as well as the um, elected city officials and the school um, board trustees and staff and administration. So that's my motion. Do we have a second? I'm confused, Georgia. Can you just I'm just, I'm just, I just, I made a motion to approve it as it is. It's not that hard, I'm sorry. It was a lot of words, I'll clean it up. I made a motion to approve 9.1, move forward on it, right, as is, as was presented, and I'm, I don't know, also, were we getting clarification on that, that we are, do you need clarification on the direction of three versus two? Because for me, that's a huge equity issue for folks at PB High, not having this. Yeah, it, we've always won in three. Um, Watsonville PD has tried um, tried significantly this year to provide PVHS one. Unfortunately, they also are experiencing staffing challenges, so it's it's expensive for everyone to live here, um, and Michelle. so because of that, they they haven't had enough staff to be able to do that. And I'll say, I my cousin was the sheriff in Monterey County, and I even reached out to the the sheriff's department to see if they could staff it. They didn't have enough staff either. So yeah. we've been trying to staff this PB High SRO, and there isn't. There's some new, I think, cadets coming forward, et cetera. So hopefully this year we'll get one. But it wasn't for lack of trying. We really tried. Right, and I just so I just want to make sure that we're moving forward with the intent for three, right, at all three contemporary high schools. So my motion is to approve this um, action item 9.1, as is to move forward with hopefully the hope that we're going to eventually have it at all three contemporary high schools, and just also to provide the um, this, the superintendent with direction to um, get this negotiation matter um, on the intergovernmental relation committee meeting. It, point um, before does before we before we second that does that sound appropriate to give that type of a direction in this particular item? Yes, I think it's fine. Okay. I would just encourage us to be cautious with other communication. Um, for the Brown Act violation that I mentioned. I'm just trying to safeguard everyone. Right. Okay, I'll second. Thank you. All right, so I have a first and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, motion carries 601. Thank you. All right, moving on to item 9.2, approve resolution number 222347, energy services contract for amendment one of comprehensive energy infrastructure renewal and power resiliency program. Clint Rucker, it's you. Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. So as I presented at the public hearing earlier, this is the actual resolution that we will adopt to allow us to move forward with the amendment to Climatex um, original phase one commitment that we made. For Trustee Dodge, I know you came in a little late, so I'll just briefly uh, remind, remind the board what this is regarding. It's regarding providing solar as well as new LED lighting to sites across our district. The solar will be at the district office and actually will um, result in savings to the district. And the LED lighting will actually be at sites across our district that actually sit in all of our trustees boundaries. So each site will be getting um, LED lighting. It'll bring us to full LED lighting across our district, as well as bring the district office to net zero energy. Um, and before I ask the board to approve this resolution, I also just want to say a thank you to Tyler, who sat here waiting for it to make sure that he was here for any questions, and as well as Rob Reading, who joined us from Climate Tech as well. He was at Santa Cruz City it's a board meeting, but wanted to come here as soon as he finished to support. So appreciate both of them being here and just request the board approve this resolution. Thank you, and thank you for the endurance. <clears throat> um, do we have any public speakers to this item? E
seems like a waste of money to me with no guarantee of savings and a lot of questions. And I'm reminded of a statement by a public relations firm talking about, get this, the role of our communication is to motivate behavior, to create certain perceptions, to create business results. That's close to the quote. So what business interests are benefiting from this? I want to refer you to a couple of sources of information that have made me rethink about solar, because it sounds so good. One is see a documentary called The Dimming, and it's on um, Dane Wigington's site, geoengineeringwatch.org. And he lives up in the Shasta area where they used to get a lot of sunlight with what is coming out of the plains now in the atmosphere. He is not getting the sunlight they used to get. So that questions the solar, in part, uh, functioning. Planet of the Humans is another one to see. Solar arrays at Cabrillo College, where I know someone who works just recently, they cut down a hundred trees by the technology lab and the children's center there to put these solar arrays over the parking lot. That's very, very destructive. Another place yeah. where they changed lighting, all this asbestos Thank came you. down. That was two minutes. Big problems. Thank you. If I were there, I would vote no, but I'm not. Any discussion from the board? Trustee Dodge, Jr.? Thank you for being here. You know, I, I've, I've known we've had this conversation before, and I, I appreciate you being here so we could see you. You know, I, I remember when I first came here, you know, consultant this and that, and like, where are they at? Why are we handing out these contracts if they can't even show up? So I, I just like to say thank you for always showing up to the meetings. Um, and if it's a, appropriate, is this the same thing as Watsonville High? Is this, if I could ask that question, if it's not going too far off, is this something related to that? So, in what way, just to clarify? Like, you know, we have solar at Watson behind the parking lot. But, how, you know, are, is this like the same type of program where cost savings? And yeah, so I'll, I'll dip in a little bit to what we talked about during the public hearing. Um, what we did with... Uh, Wattsville High was a power purchase agreement. Laws have now changed where we're actually able to directly receive those savings. Mm -hmm. So on top of the fact that we'll be saving, as you see in the item, about $380,000 in the first year, we also have the potential of receiving about 25 to 30% back from installing the solar at, um, at uh, the district office. So similar process in terms of installing the solar at the DO, a little bit different of a rebate the way we'll receive it. and. Um, for the LED lighting, Watsonville High actually will receive new LED lighting as one of the sites to now fully be LED lit. Thank you, and th thank you for being a lot of, you know, we have long meetings, but I know you stay the whole time, so I would just like to say thank you. Anyone else? Trustee Flores? Quickly, I'll make a little comment. Um, so for the solar panels, I know the initial cost can be quite a lot, and it takes you know a good amount of years to recoup those costs. And then after that is savings, which is great. Um, I just recently learned, though, that if because of this change that's happening in a month, would there be the opportunity to um, get solar panel, like in additional sites, if we have sites available, get somewhere where not leasing them, it's kind of like there's – so the one, the program that I was looking at, they come put them on, they own the solar panels, but there's always that option to, to buy them out in later years. But the reason that we're doing it now is because we can lock it in now without having the upfront costs. We are locking in that other thing. 
Uh, great question. Uh, in the future, yes, under NEM 3.0 or net billing tariff, um, you can definitely look at renewable energy at other sites. And there's multiple different ways that you could fund that. You could fund that through what is traditionally called a municipal lease. You can do a power purchase agreement where somebody else owns it, maintains it, and you get a benefit of it, or you can buy them out. Um, or you could use capital, which all the savings drops to the bottom line, like in this instance, and then you're getting a refund. So there's multiple different programs moving forward to look at some of your smaller sites. But as Clint mentioned, uh, PV High, which is the, the engineering is part of this program for the NEM 2.0, and for the district office for the engineering and the implementation, there are the two highest sites of utility expenditures um, left at your district. So that's why they were focused on. Anyone else? Can I make a motion to yes, support this item? Thank you. All right, I've got a first. Do I have a second? I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to item 9.3, resolution 22-23-39, temporary borrowing between funds for fiscal year 2023-2024. Clint, still you. Thank you so much, President Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. So as I presented during the public hearing, this is a resolution to be able to uh, transfer cash between funds. Again, our own funds, typically our bond fund, Fund 21. As I noted before, this is not anything abnormal for a district. This does not show any signs of fiscal distress. It's simply a way that we can continue to ensure that when we receive those large payments of property tax in December and April, if we ever have a cash shortage in between those two months, we're able to borrow from other funds to ensure that we're able to make all of our payments. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any discussion from the board? I'll entertain a motion. The motion to approve. I have a first. Do I have a second? I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 403. On to item 9.4, resolution 22-23-38, temporary cash borrowing from the Santa Cruz County Office of Education fiscal year 2023-24. Thank you, President Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. This uh, resolution is one more of our borrowing resolutions of the three. This one is actually borrowing from our County Office of Education. And the reason we do this one is, uh, as you'll see in the upcoming one, um, from the county treasury. We're only able to actually borrow from the county office versus the county treasury during certain times. So this one actually allows us to kind of, uh, with the county office of education, to be able to cover the time that the treasury will not allow us to actually borrow from the treasury, which is between April and June 30th. Any public speakers to this item? No, we do not. Any discussion from the board? Uh, Trustee Dodge Jr. I'll throw you a curveball. When we pull these kind of loans, the, does the county ever ask, why are you doing this? No. So as I mentioned before, with school districts, we get two very large allocations after property tax. So December and April is when we see those big, large um, payments. So in between those months, all school districts across the county, across the state can tend to see some um, cash deficiencies in those months. We actually haven't had to borrow from the county office in years because of the fact that we have that bond fund. Um, but typically we pay it back before there's, again, it's not really a loan where you, we're paying interest. It's simply borrowing cash until our cash comes in. The county office is aware when our cash comes in. So they're always willing to support us and they understand really it's just the nature of doing business in a school district. It's throwing you a curveball. Thank of course, you. appreciate it. Can I have a motion? All right, got a motion. Can I have a second? Second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Okay. Yay. All right. Okay, motion carries uh, 502. Uh, going on to item 9.5, resolution 22-23-48, temporary cash borrowing from Santa Cruz County Treasurer for fiscal year 2023-24. Clint Thank Rucker, you once again, CBO. President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. So the last of the three borrowing resolutions, this one, as I noted in the prior one, this is actually the one from the Treasury, so the Santa Cruz Treasury. This one allows us to do borrowing up until the end of April. Again, 
So when we do need to borrow, typically our stance is we start with our funds, then we go to the treasury, then we go to the county office as our last resort if it's in that last month. As I noted before, we typically do not have to borrow from any of these um, or utilize these resolutions. They are just typical resolutions we have in place just in case cash flow becomes an issue in the future. Um, as I noted, we haven't had that problem in the past few years. Any public speakers to this item? And we do not. Any discussion from the board? And I have a motion. Motion to approve. All right. Okay, so I've got a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Thank you. All right. Moving on to item 9.6, resolution 22-23-43. Our after school professionals appreciation week, April 25th through April 29th. Report will be presented by Jennifer Littleton Bruno, our director of expanded learning. I'm Jen Littleton Bruno, the Director of Expanded Learning, and I'm pleased to bring to you tonight a resolution for After School Professionals Week, and I'm joined with a couple of our after school um, staff members tonight. Whereas from April 25th through April 29th, after school programs across the nation will observe After School Professionals Appreciation Week. Pajaro Valley Unified School District trustees and staff acknowledge that our after-school professionals who provide a variety of extended learning opportunities during out-of-school hours have a positive effect on our children's families and communities. Whereas the after-school professionals of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District are fully committed to providing meaningful academic and enrichment opportunities for our students. We ask that you approve this resolution to honor the work that after school prog program providers are providing across our district daily to over 4,000 students at 30 different school sites from the hours of 6.50 a.m. until 6 p.m. daily. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Do we have any discussion from the board? Uh, Trustee Dodge Jr.? Uh, I would just like to say thank you for many years, not just this year, but many years. I used to go to the after school program at, at Mini White, uh, me and my brothers, and you know, we, we were always well fed and taken care of. But I also see, too, when I pass by Mini White currently, and I happen to pass by Radcliffe and see the children after school, and then I see the children playing, you know, four or five o'clock, and uh. Thank you for, for feeding. I like to say us because I, I was a product of that myself. So um, just thank you for all you guys and the hard work, all the people that are teaching and cooking the food. And it's an important role. So I'd just like to say thank you very much, and I'd like to make a motion to support this agenda item. All right, first and second, but do we have any other comments? Um, just in great, amazing support for the work that you do to help keep kids safe a lot of kids used to go home to empty homes and get have bad things happen to them or get into trouble or be bored or whatever and the enrichment that you provide across the district for our families and children is amazing so thank you very very much and i just wanted to add you know i've, I've had three kids who have you know, benefited from the after school programs and, you know, like they come come home and they're like, Mom, I know how to make tortillas and they're like making these like flour tortillas and we've we had burritos from the tortillas for many nights in a row, but they were really excited, so we had it was great. And but you know, but the the love of that, you know, and them enjoying that and then the art and the you know, just that that expanded opportunity, you know, for them to learn and love learning. You know, and, and Lego Club and just like all sorts, of just that, that opportunity to kind of explore interests, you know, and, and to get help if they were struggling, you know, in, in, in with homework and things like that. So, um, so thank you. Um, so we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Thank you. All right, uh, resolution 22-23-44, uh, National Child Abuse Prevention Month. Clint, it's back to you. 
Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Yes, I have the honor of presenting the resolution for national um, for a resolution for the board to approve April as the month for National Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month. Um, I, I thought of coming up and re reading the whereas is. Um, I think what really stuck out to me is last year when we did this resolution, there were 391,470 reported cases in 2020. This year, we're up to 416,970. So it's about 25,000 more cases reported this year. So I think that alone speaks impacts of why this is so important and why the work we do to ensure that our children's safety is so important. Um, I could speak about this resolution and speak more, but I think after hearing Trustee DeSerpa speak about her experiences and I'm sure all of your experiences, I would like to just open it up to the board to make comments because I'm sure all of you have um, a lot to say about this amazing resolution and I would ask that you approve it. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do. We have one. Marilyn? Nine, 9.7? Marilyn? Yeah, Garrett. Okay. Uh, National Child Abuse Prevention Month, right? Um, there are many ways children are abused, and we know some of the well-publicized ways that are valid. However, in addition, I consider poisoning children harming children as abusive, especially when you've been informed of the harm. And I refer to several things here. I gave you a while ago uh, Escuela Sin Wi-Fi in Spanish. And it's Wi-Fi in school making your child sick. That's the last thing I would want to do, is to make children sick in any way with pesticides or anything. When I was teaching at Calabasas, I remember going out the door, standing there, as the grounds person is spraying herbicide. And I had to stop him and go into the principal's office. It was considered routine. Here, um, this non-ionizing radiation has been confirmed through thousands of scientific studies to cause a whole list of symptoms. You've been repeatedly provided documentation over 20 years of the harm by me. All of the above symptoms and chronic cumulative exposure can lead to serious life-threatening health problems such as cancer, leukemia, brain tumors, and diabetes. There's a real easy way you can prevent this kind of abuse. Remove the Wi-Fi, replace it you. with wired internet. Thank you. I'm very serious. Do we have any discussion from the board? I just wanted to say, you know, in the patient care that I did, the health outcomes that I saw, you know, the, the long-term health effects I saw from Patients who had history of drug use, homelessness, all had long-term trauma. You know, it, it, it started somewhere, and a lot of times it started with childhood trauma. And if passing a resolution is a little tiny step, a little tiny, tiny drop in the bucket that can help, of course. Um, does anybody else have anything they want to say? 
perfectly. Um, I will say that I, I believe during the COVID times in, in the counties in our region, um, child abuse reports were down because we didn't have a staff with eyes on children. And so as a protective factor, our schools um, help report abuse to children. And so thanks to all of our staff and um, for, to the training that they get in order to identify and intervene on child abuse. So uh, I'll make a motion to support this. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Thank you. Um, going on to item 9.8, approve resolution 222345, recognizing April as National Bilingual, Bilingual Multilingual Learner Advocacy Month. And a report will be presented by Michael Berman, our Director of Equity, State, and Federal Program and Accountability. Good evening, President Home, members of the board, Dr. Rodriguez. It is once again my honor to bring forth the resolution to recognize April as National Bilingual Multilingual Learner Advocacy Month. Just a couple whereases. Um, National Bilingual Multilingual Learner Advocacy Month is an opportunity to draw attention to the persistent inequities between multilingual learners and native English speaking students. Um, and then also that it recognizes the significant linguistic and cultural assets that bilingual and multilingual learners bring to our schools. Um, so I hope that it's resolved that Pajaro Valley Unified School District will proclaim April 2023 as National Bilingual Multilingual Learner Advocacy Month and continue to strengthen our education and um, focus on bilingual and multilingual learners. And just a quick plug, we are launching it with our next Monday Mini, um, which celebrates our dual language pr programs and our seal of biliteracy for our parents. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do, we have one, Roddy. Good evening again. So um, I would love to stand up here and, and wholeheartedly support this resolution. Um, unfortunately, it just seems like it is empty words at this point. So PVFT has been proposing for many, many, many years, long before I was part of the negotiations team or, or in this role as chief negotiator, a, bling, a bilingual stipend for our bilingual educators. Currently, we have a stipend in contract where if you have a BCLAD, meaning a bi bilingual credential, and you are in a designated bilingual program, you receive a very small stipend for that amount of extra work. However, this does not provide any stipend to the numerous positions that we have that utilize their bilingual skills. We have positions like SLPs, RSPs, psychologists, counselors, and numerous bilingual teachers who are not teaching in designated bilingual programs who do not receive that stipend. So hearing that we are designating this month as bilingual educators and in the support of bilingual learners, while we have been refuted a stipend for those people who are providing a valuable contribution to our schools and communities, seems like empty words and ways for you to pat yourselves on the back without really doing anything about creating an actual bilingual community that's respected and supported. Do we have any discussion from the board? Mr. Dodge Jr. First of all, that's a great point. You know, maybe that's something we could look into a uh, bilingual stipend. Um, but, but also I'd like to say, you know, thank you, Michael Berman, you know, for recognizing you know, the, the biliteracy seal. You know, I haven't been here that long, but when, when I get to go to the graduations at Watson High, how proud students you know, are to have their seal. And I also too like, you know, to go along with the district. I know when the floods first happened, I know Spanish teachers that wanted to go to their fairgrounds and volunteer with translation services. And I believe we sent, we sent staff, didn't we, to, to, to speak and uh, I, I, uh, I have a lot of issues of what happened with the fairground, but we'll just keep it positive. But um, I, you know, I just you know wanted to thank PVSD for sending translation staff and uh, a teacher at Watsonville High who 
after the the levy busted, I believe it was Friday night or Saturday night, the next day there was a Spanish teacher who emailed me and said, Danny, you know, I want to go. We have lots of students who want to go translate. And so I just wanted to say thank you for our program and for the teacher and the students who wanted to go volunteer. Like I said, Monterey County and the, the shelter, frustrating, but I'll just keep it positive and thank you, PVUSD and students and teachers. Thank you. I have a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. I have a first. Do I have a second? Second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 601. Very much. All right. We've got um, item 9.9, .9, resolution 22-23-46, Autism Acceptance Month. A uh, report will be presented by Heather Gorman, SELPA Director and Special Services. Good evening, President Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees. We are here to present Autism Acceptance Month, and I'm going to hand this over to Mark Wentzler, our lead behaviorist in the district. Uh, good evening, President Holm, board members, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I prepared this nice long speech, but I've decided to shorten it a little bit, given the hour. Uh, but I'm going to start off with, um, I'm here tonight to present a resolution to make April 2023 Autism Acceptance Month. Last year, Heather Gorman uh, presented to you the importance of changing it from Autism Awareness Month to Autism Acceptance. Um, to It's an important change to supporting inclusivity and acceptance of the neurodiversity for individuals with autism. Um, since it's my first year working in PV as a lead behaviorist, I'm just going to share just a little bit of my experience related to autism to just shed some light on this topic. Um, I began working with individuals with autism back 23 years ago. Uh, I was a UCSC student and I was hired as a behavior therapist to use Applied Behavior Analysis, or ABA, to teach young children important communication, social, and life skills. Um, when I took the position with Easter Seals, I had never really heard of autism. Um, I'll never forget the first boy I worked with. He was a cute little blue-eyed, uh, he had little blonde curls. He couldn't talk. I called him Little Man. Um, we bonded and uh, he made a lot of progress in the ABA therapy and it kind of just committed me to this work. I mean, I've been doing it for 23 years now. Um, he benefited from the structured ABA, but he also benefited just from the relationship we had and the connection that we made and just when we played together. Um, gonna skip ahead a little bit. Um, the big news back then when I started, this was in you know the year 2000, uh, was one in 150 children being born were diagnosed with autism. That was like shocking news back then. Um, now today it's one in 44 children are being diagnosed. Um, in 1970, it was one to two in 10,000. So I think that should just make us all pause a little bit. Um, those numbers are also reflected in the increasing numbers of students with autism that require specialized evidence-based practices um, for us to support their uh, intensive individualized needs. Um, but the whole idea of acceptance is just that, you know, they, they have things that, that are valuable and strengths and we just need to also, as we want to support them and teach them with these evidence-based practices, there's, you know, real value that they have as individuals. So I think that's important for us to think about. Um, just one other thing, uh, they also used to have the puzzle piece, but it's now the infinity symbol, the rainbow infinity symbol, just to also kind of symbolizes that like diversity and um, understanding the neurodiversity and the importance and what pe these individuals bring and is valuable. Um, just one other thing about me, I also uh, am a parent. I have two adult sons with autism um, who I love a lot and they have all these amazing qualities and things that I cherish. but they're always going to need a lot of a little extra support. Um, I'm lucky to say they're thriving right now. They get support from Santa Cruz Supported Living and from the Community Life Services. They are living independently with that support. Um, and it's funded by San Andreas Regional Center. And I just want to say that, uh, you know, it's my wife and I have so many things that we celebrate about our two boys, but you know we have to learn that it's really through accepting them that we just 
find value. And I'm just proud to say PV is, uh, the PVUSD SELPA is celebrating Autism Acceptance Month by promoting a variety of activities for all students to learn about accepting and celebrating individuals with autism in our district. Um, I'll just do a couple of the whereases. Uh, Supporters can participate, or whereas supporters can participate in World Autism Month by taking the pledge to create a world where all people with autism can reach their full potential by increasing understanding and acceptance, whereas students with ASD can achieve success in school when provided with well-implemented evidence-based practices and inclusive educational opportunities. So I propose that the PV USD Board of Education declares the month of April 2023 as Autism Acceptance Month. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do, we have one, Marilyn. Maybe this should be titled, and it's a tragic, all the autism when I started teaching in 1965, you never heard of autism. There's something that some factors of toxicity affecting these children that has increased dramatically over the years. And it corresponds to vaccines, and it corresponds to the microwave radiation. In terms of the microwaves, I want to refer you to the work of Dr. Dietrich Klinghardt, who looked at 10 mothers who had autistic children and 10 mothers who had normal children. The key factor was the sleeping location of the mother during pregnancy being in a high electromagnetic field like Wi-Fi. That didn't happen when I had my daughter, who is now 55, because this was not around on the Wi-Fi. Serious factor. I'm going to give you a couple of pieces of information. Also, when my daughter graduated high school from Aptos High in 1985, it was not mandatory to have vaccines. I signed a form objecting. Now they're forcing these injections on children. So I'm going to give you vaccination. The greatest lie ever told that vaccines are safe and effective. This is from Weston A. Price Foundation, not from the vaccine manufacturers. And it has important facts related Thank to you. autism. Two minutes. Also one called COVID shots for Thank adults you, and children, what we now know. Thank you. Children that should not minutes. be Thank poisoned. You. Do we have any discussion from the board? I would just like to say that um, there's the conversation, the shift from awareness to acceptance is, you know, I, I said this last year, but I'm going to repeat it because it's so important. Um, you know, I have a couple of friends on the spectrum who weren't diagnosed until you know, well into adulthood, you know, well after, you know, I knew them and it was like, ah, oh, this explains so much, you know, and it's like folks on the spectrum have been here for a long time. We're, you know, a lot of the number increases because we're recognizing it. That, that needs to be taken into account for the numbers as well. Um, and when we look at acceptance, when we recognize the, the beauty that is neurodiversity, when we start looking at things about universal design that allows for diversity and differences, there's something synergistic and beautiful that can happen for everybody. And I've been learning about that as an educator, 
you know, as I'm, you know, changing, you know, my own design curriculum. And it's, it's very powerful. And um, so thank you. Trustee DeSerpa, did you have something you wanted to Just, add? Um, thank you for waiting so long tonight. Yes. Thank you for being the parent of two awesome kids. I'm also a parent of a special needs kid and um, families um, are very special as well. And uh, yeah, yes. So anyway, thank you for being here tonight and I appreciate you coming to present this with Heather. I really do. I'd like to make a motion to support. A first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank, you. thank you. Motion carries 601. Moving on to item uh, 9.10, approved memorandum of understanding between PVUSD and PVFT emergency flood evacuation days and impacts for 2022-23. Report will be presented by Allison Yazawa, our Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources. Yes, thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So I actually have two MOUs um, to present to you tonight with PVFT. Um, we wanted for this last, I guess, atmospheric uh, river, wanted to be able, it would, and the impact it had, as we saw in Pajaro, um, provide an additional three days um, for those um, employees who are affected by the mandatory evacuations. So it's very similar. It's almost lifted off the MOU that we did in January. So um, we were able to work quickly with PVFT to put this one together. And then <laughs> a couple days later, put the second one together with, as we saw that what happened when the levee broke and that this was going to take families and our staff a little bit longer to recover from. Um, we pulled some language from an, the CZ fire MOU that we had done before. So in the contract, it says that employees can only use up to 10 personal necessity days of their own in a school year. So the second MOU that's also attached extends that so they can it, go beyond 10 days of their own if they have that in order to continue to get paid and, and take the time. In addition, um, the pieces that we lifted from the other um, MOU was about if that still isn't enough or they run out of time, that being able to go on an unpaid leave but still benefited for up to a month or take a personal leave for the end to the end of the school year. So right now, the timelines for, for certificated employees to ask for a personal leave have lapsed. So this MOU actually allows for them to get it um, and kind of wave those timelines. So again, super appreciate uh, the conversations we were speaking on Friday night, <laughs> Nellie and I, trying to put these together for, for her members. So I respectfully request that the board approve these um, this evening. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. One, Nellie. Glad I stayed awake for this. <laughs> um, good evening, board. Uh, yes, thank you to um, Allison to Dr. Rodriguez for being receptive and wanting to work on an MOU to address the the storm that came through and did some pretty serious damage. Uh, I would this this we are you know the counties were in a state of emergency and so the only thing that um, that I would like to see is for those teachers who um, were blocked by. Uh, down trees from their from their streets and not being able to basically leave their neighborhood to get to work to not have to use their personal necessity day um, for that because the MOU is for specifically written to address um, floods the evacu the evacuation mandate so when you're prevented from getting to work uh, due to road closures that's it's not an evacuation mandate um, so that's that's all the only ask. Um, Allison was, was gracious enough to, we had a conversation about that as we were working on this MOU and that it would be like having, you know, hearing on a case by case. Uh, but there's, I think, a lot of cases. <laughs> and, and so I, I think, in, you know, in regards to it being a state of emergency uh, and there only being one way, one roadway open for um, a couple days between Monterey and Santa Cruz that also just prevented. So I do appreciate as well. I had a conversation with Dr. Rodriguez and <clears throat> acknowledging that we have members who drop their children off at school in the morning and or daycare. And so they, they don't have the ability on a moment's notice to change their schedule to a, 
to try to get on the road one or two hours earlier to get to work on time. So um, I stepped into the classroom on Wednesday to help at, at Watsonville High for a, a teacher that was stuck in traffic. And, um, you know, so we, we definitely appreciated that on that day, teachers that were showing up many hours late uh, were not going to be docked any of their leave. That's That was important. So thank you for that. Um, and then just, you know, thanks for, I hope that you approve this. Um, and yeah, our people can't fly. We're, we're working on it though. Technology is it's on, its, on its way. Thanks. Do we have any public, uh, that, that was public speech. It's getting a little late. All right, do we have any discussion from the board? Just I'd like to make a motion to approve. First and a second. Uh, yeah. Totally agree with all this, but I, I'd just like to, if we could ask Gavin Newsom to hurry up and please <laughs> declare of a state an emergency so our teachers can get FEMA help. You know, I know there's an issue in Monterey County again. Um, Gavin Newsom, please declare of a state emergency for our teachers. Thank you. Thank you. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries uh, 601. All right, going on to item 9.11, approve memorandum of understanding between PBUSD and CSCA chapter 132, emergency flood evacuation days and impacts 2022-23. Allison. Yes, thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. These are identical MOUs I just presented, but for our CSCA um, members. So again, additional uh, evacuation days for those that were in evacuation zones, as well as similar language with regards to waiving the amount of PN days and reasons for taking personal necessity, as well as um, unpaid leaves with benefits for up to a month and then unpaid leaves. Classified contract is a teensy bit different where they can apply for a personal leave whenever throughout the year, but it's not a guarantee. And so this is providing them some precaution that if they did apply for it or ask it or request it, it would be granted. So that's a little bit of a difference, but same language. So I respect the leave request that you approve these two MOUs as well. Yeah. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any discussion from the board? Do Trustee Dodge Jr. Just the same thing. Gavin Newsom, yes. please declare a state of emergency for Monterey County. Uh, I received a lot of messages of people who were evacuated that work in the district as classified workers. Um, uh, one specifically, you know, she lived in San Juan Road. Um, she's in a hotel. You know, she needs help with food. And, you know, a lot of stories that we all have heard about Monterey County and, and they can't go back home. You know, there's people right now on the bridge waiting to go home. A lot of our workers, you know, bus drivers, and you know, I just, hopefully the governor, you know, somehow, some way, we, we could find a way to make sure we could get our classified workers back home, let them go home. Thank you. Is that a motion? Yes, can I make a motion to support the agenda? Thank you. I'll second that. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Um, item 9.12, approve emergency flood evacuation days and impacts for the 2022-2023 school year for unrepresented and management employees. Yes, thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So not an MOU, but an item to approve for unrepresented employees, yard duties, our confidential employees, and our professional services, as well as our management. So again, Additional three evacuation days for those in the evacuation zones, use of personal necessity, and unpaid leave options. So I respectfully request that you approve this item for those employees in our district as well. Thank you. Any uh, public speakers to this item? No, we do not have any. Any discussion from the board? I have a motion. motion. Second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Item 9.13, approve uh, total compensation for non-management confidential employees for the 2021-2022 and 2022-2023 school years. Allison, it's still you. Yes, it's me and the last one, so you can. Um, yes, so thank you, President Home Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. This is the total compensation for our confidential employees. Again, these are our non-management. They are classified employees, but they are unrepresented 
due to the nature of their positions, which are governed by ed code of that they need to be unrepresented and cannot be unionized. Um, so again, this is for a four and a half percent for 21, 22 with an $1,800 one-time payment and a 10% for 22, 23 with a $1,500 payment, one-time payment, as well as the addition of Juneteenth as a holiday. Um, again, this is the exact same agreement we entered into with CSEA. And so I think there's also some additional information. Um, Sylvester, if you wouldn't mind just scrolling down the item a little bit too to just show some comparable data um, with regards to these two positions and others in the area. Sylvester, sorry. <laughs> yep, just, you don't have to open them, just, or you can, but I was just, oh, just on the item. Yeah, just right there. Perfect, just right there. No, stop. There. Thank you. Thank you. All right, do we have any uh, public speakers to this item? We do, we have one. Roddy, is she still here? Do we have any discussion from the board? Um, let's see. So, uh, Trustee Dodge Jr. Uh, I received a lot of comments and emails. I even received a handwritten letter from a constituent of my district, and I just <laughs> wanted to say thank you for that handwritten letter. Um, we, we had some good conversations, and um, I, 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 I listen. You know, I listen to my constituents and my neighbors. And they said that this is important. It's an important step in our district. Um, so I'd like to make a motion to support this agenda. Okay. I'll second that. Um, but I did have a comment. Okay, go ahead. Or a question. Um, because we had talked about, you know, this is actually four positions, and we see, see what those four positions are. Um, and two of them are vacant or not filled. and then there's just two employees right now in two of those positions. But my, my question that I had in regards to you know, non-management confidential employees, um, what category does the district's PIO fall into? She's management, classified manager. So that, oh, that's classified management. Yeah. Okay, because um, I, I just almost thought that the nature of that would have been um, confidential but so, thank you for the clarification yeah so just if to further clarify so technically all of us are confidential employees right I mean we have private student information that we're in, we're pervy to or personal personnel data right that we all have the thing about confidential employees is that you know the the position of the district with negotiations so obviously Lindsay in my office works I work with HR she sits in negotiations with us to take notes and stuff like that that's what makes her a confidential employee in that sense and then Eva being um, or the executive assistant to, to the superintendent, you are also, again, purview to different information or positions of the district that you wouldn't know. That's what classifies them as confidential, and there's ed code around governing those positions. So I just didn't bring that up maybe last time, but just to understand the difference between confidentiality, as we all are actually confidential in terms of the information that we receive with student data, but these ones are specifically governed by ed code. Right, and and part of the my curiosity in clarifying that is because it's also about who sits in closed session, and so there's lots of as you're saying confidential employees in this district, but they're not all invited into closed session. So I was just wanting I didn't know if there was something around that as well or not. So, but thank you for the clarification. Absolutely, appreciate it. So you have a first and second. And, but I also have some more comments, so Trustee DeSerpa. Yeah, thank you um, to my fellow board members for supporting this item. Um, these are two people that are um, not very high paid, um, that this money will mean a lot to, and they're also very hard workers, very, very hard workers, and uh, I feel badly that we didn't approve this in the last meeting, and so thank you to my fellow board members for recognizing that this is important to two people that are very hard workers for us. Are there any further comments? We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Um, item 9.14, high school physics adoption. Report will be presented by Michael Russo, our science director. Hi, good evening, Board President Holm, Board of Trustees and Dr. Rodriguez. I'm Mike Russo, the science director. 
and in our ongoing transition to the next generation science standards, our physics teachers have recently evaluated new instructional materials. And I'm here tonight to provide you with a quick overview of that selection process, emphasis on quick, and uh, our teacher's recommendation for the board. Um, here you can see a timeline. They spent about four months screening uh, publishers. I'll show you the publishers in a minute and analyzing the data from that screening. Uh, this is, we had all the physics teachers in the comprehensive high schools were involved. They were on the adoption team, two from Aptos, one from PV High, and one from Watsonville. We looked at these four different publishers and those are the names of their physics texts. And the process we used was similar what I've presented in the past around for our chemistry adoption and our biology adoption and uh, environmental studies was the last one that I was presented. Uh, so there are the four texts that we evaluated, the teachers evaluated. And um, here are the tools that we use. This is the main tool we use and it's called the, the time toolkit for or a toolkit for instructional material evaluation. And we evaluated each of the publisher texts across these five different criteria. So use of phenomena uh, as an engaging question uh, along an inquiry uh, for students to explore and motivate them to dig deeper and explore the content. Uh, presence of a logical instructional sequence, very important for teachers and student understanding. Criteria three is critical, and that's a focus of ours, is having students doing the thinking and figuring it out. And then criteria four deals with the three dimensions of the NGSS, uh, so skills and cross-cutting concepts and the content, the core ideas. Criteria five is our district-specific lens, and the next slide talks about that in detail. This is... Um, this was developed by teachers and district leaders years ago to highlight uh, adoption considerations for our diverse students. So that was the fifth criteria. The next thing I'm gonna show you is the, the, the time protocol actually collects both quantitative and qualitative data. And here's a slide showing the scores. There's a lot of information up there, um, but each of the four teachers evaluated all four publishers across the five criteria on the top row. In addition, they gave an overall score, each teacher did, and they also gave a recommendation on whether we should move forward with that text and possibly adopt that text. So the scoring kind of rubric is on the left. If uh, if in criteria one, under the use of phenomena, if that text showed strong evidence, the teacher gave it a score of a three. If it showed adequate, a two, and limited or no evidence, a one. So we had four teachers, so a total score of 12, and you could see McGraw-Hill on the first criteria scored nine out of 12. So that will explain the, the rest. Um, and then on the recommendation on the far right column, the Y indicates a yes and the small s indicates strongly. So two teachers strongly recommended that we adopt McGraw-Hill and two teachers uh, said yes, we should adopt it. So you could see, and my highlighting uh, makes it pretty obvious that McGraw-Hill scored the highest across all the criteria. And so I just want to uh, share a few of the strengths of the McGraw-Hill Inspire Physics text. Uh, the first one is that it uses a 5E lesson in instructional model, and that's engage, explore, explain, elaborate, and evaluate. And this is uh, one of the best practices around NGSS for increasing uh, student engagement, critical thinking. And uh, it also aligns nicely with our biology adoption and our chemistry adoption also uses that 5E lesson model, 
which is nice so when students transition to the next grade, they're familiar with that model. Um, McGraw-Hill Inspire Physics also has a number of digital tools that really allow students to access understanding of the curriculum. And then the last, the teacher comment there just talks about how it really uh, helps students um, understand phenomena and the content, and that's what we're looking for in a text. And so the physics adoption team recommends and asks the school board to please approve McGraw-Hill California Inspire Physics as our new high school adoption starting next year. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any discussion or comments from the board? I have a motion. A motion to approve. I have a first. Do I have a second? Okay, I've got a first and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, motion carries 601. Thank you. On behalf of our physics teachers, I appreciate it. All right. Um, so item 9.15, um, PBOC transportation plan. Um, Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, my name is Katie Bajazi. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Director of Transportation. Um, I first wanted to apologize that I couldn't be here um, at the last meeting to present the transportation plan um, to you. I am grateful for Mark and Mona stepping up in my absence. Um, I'm here this evening before you to report that we did not receive any feedback on the plan as presented. Um, and as mentioned on March 8th, this is a living document that can be um, or that will be brought back annually for your approval. Um, and as a department, we will continually con collaborate with CSEA and our um, other stakeholders to ensure that the plan is up to date, relevant, and encompasses the to totality of the plan requirements. So staff respectfully um, request your approval of the plan as presented this evening. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any discussion from the board? Uh, Trustee Dodge, Jr. So did you just say you had no feedback from your workers? I mean, from what I've been hearing the last year, you've had some angry workers. Yes. And no one gave any feedback. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. Um, some of my, the parents in my area, um, some of the schools have released early start times, like 7.30 in some schools. Have, and I, I've been told it's a function of the, the transportation. If we were able to change that in the future, what, what would that, was that a function of not enough drivers or if, if at some point in the future, or is there, what, what, would, what would that take? to be? Um, It would take a lot more drivers actually um, it's a function of our tiered bell schedule because of the um, new law that required our junior high and high schools to start later um, as a result um, because our buses have to service several schools um, we had to move some of our uh, elementary schools to earlier start time um, because we had to shift those uh, junior high and high schools to the later start time thank you welcome Let's see, um, did, 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 did you have a comment or did? I was just going to make a motion to approve. I'll take it. So I've got a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Thank you. Have a good evening. All right, take care. Item 9.16, E-rate Category 2, Network Installation Projects. Report will be presented by Dan Weiser, our Technology Director. be able to raise this up but good, good evening president home uh, board of Tr trustees and dr. Rodriguez before I present our category 2 e-rate projects I just want to take a quick second and wish a happy birthday to our own Silvestre Montejano who is spending his birthday evening with us um, and we're almost done with your birthday but happy birthday Silvestre um, 
So bring, I'm bringing forward tonight um, our annual Category 2 E-rate application. Uh, this is our infrastructure application. So this covers cabling, installation of equipment, purchase of equipment, configuration of equipment. Um, as you know, in order to maintain the robust network infrastructure to support all of our staff and students, it's a never-ending, ongoing process of upgrade. Um, and so these upgrades are, um, well, I'll go through them really quickly. Um, so we, we have core network infrastructure upgrades, and these are to support the 10 gig connections um, that we were approved a few board, mem board meetings ago. Um, and then we have um, some new infrastructure to connect our Aptos High athletic field. Uh, this is something that we've been wanting to do for a long time. So this would allow the connection across the street that, that separates the Performing Arts Center and the athletic field to finally be connected to the network so we could broadcast wireless in the athletic field um, and provide paging and other services there. Uh, and then wireless infrastructure for two schools, Ohlone and Pajaro Middle. And this is just to keep them up to speed with our current um, infrastructure. All of these projects are paid for by E-Rate, which is a federal discount program. So it winds up costing the district 15% of the cost of the equipment and installation. And then that 15% is actually paid for with Measure L bond funds. So it's, it, it, it's um, a great program that allows us to leverage those bond funds and get more for our money, and then also leverage the E-rate funds to really make sure that our network infrastructure is up to speed. Um, so the, you know, the, the total cost of the project is about 300,000. Cost of the district is about 45,000. Um, and that 45 is paid for with those Measure L bond funds. So tonight I bring these projects forward and ask for your approval and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Do we have any uh, public speakers to this item? We do one, but I think she may be gone. Marilyn? I know, I was amazed. All right. Yeah. Do, we, do we have any um, discussion or comments from the board? All right, can I have a motion? Um, I'll make a motion. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Getting there. 9.17 approve the addition of a special <coughs> board meeting to review uh, administrative salaries on March 29th, 2023. Report will be presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yes, thank you very much. So as um, the board requested at the last board meeting, the agenda setting committee um, got together and identified this upcoming Wednesday, which is um, March 29th, as a date for us to um, be able to review administrative salaries. I do want to just make a note that because it is a special board meeting, um, we actually won't take action that night. We're not allowed to take action um, because of the fact that it's a special board meeting and you can't do administrative salaries on special board meetings um, but we would like to present the information as requested so I know um, several board members have given me feedback on what they would like to um, have included in that presentation so I appreciate that feedback um, if other board members that haven't had the opportunity can give that to me that way that can ensure that I provide all the information that is requested um, and so we are requesting requesting um, March 29th um, so that we can do it um, before the spring break. Um, otherwise, because of special student recognition and all the other events that are happening, um, we wouldn't be able to do it till later, and I do feel that there's urgency on this matter. So I request the approval of um, March 29th for the special board meeting. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No, we do not. Any discussion from the board? And I have a motion. Oh, okay. Well, I, it's a great idea. I know this came out of our last meeting, um, and I understand we, there's a date, and the agenda setting committee came up with something. I appreciate the effort. I cannot make that date. I have a work commitment. I would like to be able to attend, so there's six of us here, and it would be nice to find a date that works for everybody who wants to attend, but if that date works for the rest of you, great. It doesn't work for me. I can watch it later on YouTube um, and certainly provide some feedback before and after, but we're also here, all here right now, too, so if we could find another Wednesday, that'd be cool, too. Or, or at Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Oh. 
I'll make a motion to approve. Have a, a motion. Second. All second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Sure. Absolutely. We can discuss it, yeah. I just, nobody was raising hands, so. <laughs> There's no discussion, I can't, you know. Point of order, though, we did have a vote on the table. Should we finish that first? We should. Or not? Okay. So, then we can still have it. Well, sure. What's happening? I'm sorry. I'm just trying to fig go by the rules right now. You could still have discussion after a motion's been made and but it's we, been we started, second we started for the, the vote, vote. though. So you can retract your, your request if you want. That's up to you. Or you, you can retract your motion. Your motion. Mm -hmm. okay. Or you can vote on it. But if you vote on it and it fails. I guess I'll retract my motion until okay. um, further discussion. Okay. Okay. And like the rules, so. though. Do we have further discussion? Anyone? Trustee Dodge Jr.? We do the 30th. Management can make that happen. We actually have a parent LCAP meeting that night, but we can, um, it hasn't been broadcasted, so we can make that shift. I have a question. Is that, and this would be a, a special study session that we have in the week. It's, we usually have them at start at six, right? Uh, it's a special board meeting. It's not a study or session. It's a special, it's a special board, board meeting. meeting. It would start at 6 p.m., yes. 6 p.m., right? Mm -hmm. okay. Trustee Scal, the 30th. I could be there at 6.45. You can start earlier, or you can start at 7. Would you be able to do the 28th? No, cannot do the 28th. At the 30th, I, I, I'll, I'll get there. If that works, if that's good for you, the rest of y'all. Well, maybe I'll, we I'll can move the start time, maybe to 6.30, 7. 6.30 would be nice. So the 30th at 6.30? Is that acceptable? Thank you, yeah. So a motion to have the special study session on, so, okay, I'll, I'll make a motion to have the special uh, board study session to review administrative salaries on March 30th at 6.30. Does that sound acceptable? Yeah. Good work. I'll, I'll second that if you need a second. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, so I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Aye. you. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, motion carries 601. All right. Um, Item 9.18, approve the addition of a special board study session to review PVUSD's budget on May 20th, 2023. Dr. Rodriguez? Yes, thank you. So this one actually is on a Saturday. Um, the reason for that is um, we actually have graduations even starting in May this year. Um, so when we looked at the calendar, we have 14 key events that are happening in the month of May, um, including everything from the seal of literacy to our Oscars night, to our graduations, to equity council, to our CK, TK, our CGTK donor spring visit. Um, so we have some significant events going on. And because of that, almost every night is taken up with something. And um, so we are requesting that the special board study session be after the May revise, which is why it is the date that it is. So it's later on, but before we actually present the LCAP, which will occur in um, June. 
Um, and so um, we are requesting um, Saturday, May 20th as a special board study session. Do we have any public speakers to that item? We do not. <clears throat> um, any discussion from the board? Yeah, I actually have um, a comment. Um, you know, with regards to this um, special board study session um, for uh, Saturday, May 20th, um, you know, in the interest of transparency and for the public and concerns that have been brought forward from both our collective bargaining units, um, for this special study session on the district's budget, I am calling for us to have um, an outside independent third party auditor that is of this board selection to conduct an audit on our district's budget and present their findings at this meeting and to the board in that public session. So we'd have to defer to Clint whether or not that type of timeline could even happen in that short period of time. because we do have an independent auditor that actually audits our books, um, but that generally takes pretty significant time. And so I'll let him speak to his possibility. Yeah, so that. we do have an independent auditor that audits our budget every year. They do it a year in review. So right now they're actually finishing up 20, uh, 21, 22 at the moment. Um, to do a full audit usually takes them about, probably I would guess about two to three months to review everything, to spot check things. Um, our, again, our independent auditors are looking at making sure that we're doing everything legally, that everything's falling within line. Um, they're not necessarily looking at how we're budgeting in different objects. They're more looking at are we doing it per egg code, following all the right rules and regulations. As the board may remember, our past um, at least five years of audits have all been fiscally free of findings, so we've had no findings. Um, in terms of having a third party review our budget, I wouldn't know other than the COE, but the COE again reviews our budgets every single year. President Holm, could you, um, can I ask a question? Yeah. What's the cost of having an audit? To the so district? for our audit, roughly it's about $60,000 for them to do our annual audit each year. So I guess I would ask Trustee Acosta, like, what is the purpose of this request? Where is it coming from? This same purpose is what my comments were at the last board meeting, just in the interest of transparency, concerns that have been brought forward by the public. There's also been concerns that both collective bargaining units have brought up in um, sessions about items in the budget. And again, this isn't our money. Per se, I mean, well, we are all taxpayers residing in the district or we wouldn't be sitting up here. But this, is, again, is public funds, public's money. And just in the interest of that good stewardship and transparency. Well, we already have the audit. The right. We already have an audit that happens every year. And the COE looks at our budgets routinely um, and gives us a qualification. Um, so I'm actually not in favor of spending an additional $60,000 when, when we already have these uh, important audits and reviews happening of our budget every year. And every time they've come up, there are no fine, almost, I think, no findings, if I remember correctly. Correct. Again, for the past five years at least, there have been no fiscal findings. Again, when I say no fiscal findings, we do have other findings. We did have a finding last year on our, our um, facility inspection tool. It's not a fiscal finding. It was simply based on how they were um, submitted to CDE and we just changed our process, but it wasn't actually a fiscal finding. And when I've questioned the auditors who've stood at the podium, other districts have findings. So it's, it's um, we, we've always had excellent findings year to year. And we haven't, sometimes we've used a different um, auditing firms. In my 12 years on the board, we haven't always used the same firm. So it's multiple firms. Have yeah, so we're actually required every four years, even though we have used I Bailey, we're required every four years to actually change who our lead auditor is to ensure that they're, they're switching up their auditor process as well and giving us new auditors. Even though we have the same firm, they're different actual auditors who do the work. When are we due to change auditors again? So again, we, uh, I think, let's see, we had a mod 
two years ago. So I think we have another two years with Joy, who is our current um, auditor. Again, we don't necessarily change firms, but we change the lead auditor to ensure that it is somebody new who's actually doing the audit. And the reason that we typically don't change firms is they understand our district, they know our processes, they know our system, so they know what to look for versus bringing in a brand new firm who's gonna have a harder time actually understanding your district and it's gonna, and again, this isn't just Pajaro Valley. All the districts in the county continue to use the same firm, just changing actual auditors. Any, Trustee Scal? I just, just an idea, que uh, question. I mean, I think it's, a, it's an, a, an important meeting, big meeting, and I think I as a board member would like to discuss the agenda. I don't think we have to figure it out right now, but to, to, there's gonna be some ideas, concept coming forward. And if we could just find some, at a future board meeting, talk about it and, and get some feedback input from the board, that would be nice. Um, maybe that's already or that's already going to happen, but I just think that would be that would be my request. Trustee Dodge Jr. Is it possible to have that meeting here? Yeah, we could usually when we're doing special board study sessions. It's a little bit more informal. The structure of it generally is so that it's more at tables, so that we could have kind of dive in to it. But um, we could, of course, do it here, or we could do it like we've done in other special board study sessions, where we anticipate a lot of people. We've done it in Landmark, for instance, is what we did the, the one time when when we had special. We did one on special services and we thought we were gonna get a lot of people. And so we did it there. Um, sometimes this isn't as congruent to having an actual like dive in session. Um, but I mean, we can always do that if that's what, if that's what we wanna do. It's up to my colleagues. It was just an idea. Uh, we've also had one um, at EA Hall and also at the Mellow Center so which um, we may have a little more say over and yeah hall's nice big audit. i like you hall too <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, whichever we we did landmark the second time um because people complained that parking was challenging at ea hall that's why that's why we went to landmark but um really it's it's a dimer dozen really trustee acosta when you, uh, sorry what do you think e hall I think I think EA Hall or the Mellow Center. I think, yeah. and oh. I think if it's a Saturday, it might be hard to secure this okay. venue per se too because of the city and them having to get staff. So I, th I think EA Hall or the Mellow Center. It'll be a Saturday. Trustee Flores, um, will we be able to discuss like um, Trustee Scal said, like the agenda? You know, you asked for input for the special one, but for okay. Because, yeah, I mean, we've, we've, when I first came on, I was presented a, a budget presentation, and then we had one recently, but I want something a little, a lot deeper yeah. than that. Okay. For sure, yeah. Uh, usually those um, happen during the one on ones, but we can, we can agendize it too. Dodge Jr.? To follow up with, I think EA Hall would be great because I know we just had the, um, <laughs> we just the had an event parent, in EA Hall. Parent, or parent conference. Yeah, so. mm -hmm. Yep. Which was a great event. Yeah, I think it was packed. about four of us made that to that event. No brown back violation, though. It was like two and two, two in the morning, two in the later. Do I actually have a motion? Oh, yeah. Um, generally, we do nine o'clock for Saturdays, but we can do it earlier or later. That nine? I would say we started at 10 the last time. On a Saturday, or it was actually 11. It was 10. Was it 10 or 11? The one we did for, for the replay in February. Yeah, that was 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. It's fine. That's good. So, Saturday, May 20th at 10 a.m., hopefully at Hall um, or the um, Mellow Center. Well, I'll make a motion to approve the addition of a special board study session uh, to review PVSD's budget on May 20th, 2023 at 10 a.m. 
at EA Hall. <laughs> there. He wants to make sure. <laughs> I, have, I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Any opposed? Motion carries 6-0-1. All right, consent agenda. So these are routine items coming before the board. Any public speakers to the consent agenda? Oh, no. <laughs> no, there's not. Sorry. <laughs> Didn't mean to be so abrupt about that. No, <laughs> sorry. No, there's not. I just realized you're looking at me. No worries. <laughs> okay. Um, are there any items that the board wishes to defer? Can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as is. I have a first. Do I have a second? I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> Harry is 601. Um, skipping past a, a close session to the deferred, so um, item 13.1, our action and report on closed session. Yes, um, we do have a report out of closed session. Um, with regards to item 2.1 expulsion under close sent uh, under the close uh, I'm going to get my words out of my mouth hold on under closed session agenda item number 2.1 I move to approve the recommendation by district administration of a full expulsion until December 2023 for student number 22-23-009 I need a second. OK, thank you. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Um, I move um, under closed session to item 2.2. I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on March 22nd, 2023, with seven and nine additional action items. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Under closed session item 2.3, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on March 22nd, 2023, with seven and 11 additional action items. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Under closed session item 2.6, um, the Board of Trustees voted 502 to approve a settlement agreement between PBUSD and CSEA and classified employee number 4203. Under closed session item <clears throat> uh, number 2.7, the Board of Trustees voted 502 to reject a liability claim. And I um, have a few announcements. Um, the Pajaro Valley School District is pleased to announce um, Marina Maldonado as the new academic coordinator of Amesti Elementary. Marina began her career in PVUSD as a teacher at Minnie White Elementary and has also been a teacher at Amesti, a teacher on special assignment for the PVUSD technology department, and an assistant principal for the extended learning program. She holds a bachelor's degree in sociology from UCSC, a master's in education from UCSC, and a bilingual authorization in Spanish. She also holds a, a multiple subjects teaching credential and an administrative services credential. We are excited to welcome this highly accomplished administrator to her new role with PVUSD, Go Eagles. Um, and then um, second announcement, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce Katie Chris Kunis as the new principal of Lakeview Middle School for the 2023-2024 school year. Katie began her career teaching science at North Monterey, High, Mo North Monterey County High School and in 2015 moved to Aptos High to continue her teaching career. In 2019, she moved into an administrative role at Aptos High as the Assistant Principal of Student Service Services. Katie holds a Bachelor's of Science degree from San Jose State, a single subject credential in science with specializations in science and chemistry from San Jose State, and a Master's in Educational Leadership and Administration from UMass Global. We are excited to welcome this highly accomplished administrator to her new role with PBUSD. Go. 
eagles. I, I know, I was just, okay. I was just making sure. I thought it was me and it was late. <laughs> Welcome. Great. All right. So our next uh, board meeting will be a special board meeting on March 30th, uh, 2023, and a regular board meeting on April 26th, 2023. And the meeting is adjourned at 11.57 p.m. Whew. My goodness. <laughs>